Welcome to the 11th meeting in 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. I uh, remind you before the first agenda item that uh, we should be all switching off uh, mobile phones that affect the broadcasting system. Uh, if you notice that committee members are consulting their tablets, it's for their work in the committee at the present time in digital format. We have apologies <coughs> from Claudia Beamish. And agenda item one is a decision on taking items in private. The first of these is the paper regarding the meeting in Orkney as part of the Parliament Day in Kirkwall in June. Uh, are we agreed that we should take that in private? Agreed. Uh, a letter to the Scottish Government on the Wild Fisheries Review. Are we agreed to take that in private? Mm -hmm. We are. And to seek agreement with the committee then that we do uh, these at future meetings if need be. Thank you. Second item today is subordinate legislation uh, and the consideration of a draft single-use carrier bag charge fixed penalty notices and amendments Scotland Regulation 2015. The instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means that Parliament must approve it before provisions may come into force. And uh, following the evidence session, the committee will be invited to consider the motion to approve the instrument under agenda item three. So I welcome this morning the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead. Good morning to you and your official Pete Stapleton, Policy Manager for Waste Prevention in the Scottish Government. Good morning. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary wishes to speak to the instrument. Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning to the committee. It's now five months, give or take, since we first introduced the carrier bag charging in Scotland, which, of course, has the aim of tackling... Scotland's addiction to using single-use carrier bags, of which there are hundreds of millions of them uh, being used in recent times, uh, and also its aim is to cut litter in our society at the same time. Uh, uh, clearly, the committee supported the regulations uh, originally, and it seems that the policy is working very well in Scotland just now, and some of our larger retailers are already reporting, after a matter of just a few months, up to 90% reduction in the use of bags within their, their particular stores. So that's uh, a good sign. I hope the committee will agree. And also, I think we can welcome the fact that shoppers around Scotland have uh, embraced the new policy uh, and very much welcomed it. And that's certainly that's my experience speaking to many consumers in local shops in Elgin and uh, my own constituency. But the regulations today address two issues that will help support the aims of the charge. The first is to set the level and time limit of fixed penalties for breaches of the regulations. Fixed penalties are there to complement the existing criminal sanctions, offering proportionate enforcement options for minor infractions. And while last year's Better Regulation Act established the principle of fixed penalties, these regulations before us will set the fine level at £200, as we indeed advised yourselves last year. They also provide the other outstanding details needed, the discounted amount for early payment and the time limit on issuing penalty notices. Of course, I expect very few retailers to deliberately breach the rules and that enforcement officers will, in the first instance, provide advice to retailers who are not complying. So these regulations will also amend the 2014 regulations to exempt bags used for the delivery of goods in prisons where the bag is necessary for safety or security. The prisoners who use this service have no option but to accept the bag that's given to them, and the closed environment of prisons means there's not really a litter issue, which is also one of the key aims of the, the legislation. So applying the charge there would therefore not support the purpose of reducing litter or encouraging behaviour change. So I therefore ask the committee to hopefully support the, the regulations before you. Thank you very much. Uh, do members uh, wish to uh, ask any questions? First of all, well, Jim Hume, and then. Uh, th thanks very much, Convener, and uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, it's been brought to my attention that there are some retailers selling bags at six pence. Of course, five pence is, is the amount, and that five pence, uh, if, if sold at that amount, uh, goes to charity. Uh, I just wondered if the Cabinet Secretary had evidence that uh, some retailers are also selling at six or even ten pence, and if that was the case, w would all of that six pence go to the retailer? Um, uh, as opposed to the five pence, which we know would go to uh, a charity. <clears throat> well, clearly we are urging all retailers that funds raised as a result of the legislation 
it should be devoted to good causes. And we have the carry bag commitment to which many retailers have already signed up to, where they will openly report where the, the money is going to. And as you may have seen in the news over the last few months, many retailers have uh, publicised the charities or other good causes that they're, they're going to benefit. In terms of the actual charges themselves, there are different charges in our retailers because there's different types of bags being sold. So Sainsbury's, for instance, they only sell bags for life. So the bag you get, I understand, is a multi-use bag as opposed to a single-use bag. So there's different bags being sold by different retailers. Uh, so ultimately, I guess it's their decision as to what particular bags they want to sell. Uh, and consumers will no doubt have their say at the shops in question. To further clarify that, so, <coughs> for example, where there isn't an option to take the five pence cheap bag and there's only an option to take a six pence bag, um, is all of that six pence going to the retailer or, uh, or is five pence of the six pence, which is in the legislation, uh, going towards the uh, designated charity or good cause? It'll be up to the retailer to, to calculate. Mm -hmm within the regulations what they want to give to the good causes because the regulations, you may recall, <coughs> VAT can be paid, mm -hmm. uh, the costs of administrating the scheme can be deducted, etc. And if the retailers you're referring to that are charging more than five pence are major retailers, which I suspect they are, mm -hmm. the likelihood is they signed up the carrier bag commitment, which means they will make all that information transparent okay. when the first reporting period uh, which is within six months of the charge coming into force, uh, ends, and then that information hopefully will be in the public domain on, on the website. So clearly they'll report transparently, hopefully, uh, as to where the breakdown of the six pence or ten pence, whatever goes. OK, thanks. That's useful. MD and then Dave Thompson. Thank you, Gavir. Just two small points for clarity. Local authorities will, be the enforce, will enforce the regulations. Are they being paid to carry out that duty, and to whom do the fines go? So the, the agreement we have with local governments who have worked closely with over the regulations is that they are, yes, responsible for clearly compliance. Uh, they're not specifically paid for that, per se. It's one of the duties of local government and the trading standards officers, in most cases, who carry out that function to, to enforce as they see fit. And local authorities uh, have as far as I'm concerned, to a large extent, embraced uh, the legislation. As I said in my opening remarks, for the early months of, of the new charge, it's very much a light-touch approach, and advice is given to retailers, particularly smaller retailers, who are more likely to be the ones who are relevant to this point, uh, who perhaps have not been charging if any are any, any come across. The local authority will give advice and say, look, you're, here's the regulations, here's a reminder of the regulations you're supposed to be charging. And that's how we're clearly taking a light-touch approach as people get used to the to new regulations. In terms of the fines, uh, well, my understanding is that the local authority will get the, the fixed fine. That's right, yeah. within the local authority. But in terms of the criminal sanctions, clearly that would be within the courts and the wider justice system, as per usual, with all fines. Paying the money. Right, that's fine. Thank you. Dave Thompson and then Mike Russell. Morning. Secretary, Mr Stapleton, uh, just a wee kind of follow-up uh, on, on that general point uh, about the, the fixed penalties and the, the discounted scheme. I would certainly agree with you um, as a, a past director of trading standards that the light touch approach is always the best one. You advise, you help, you cajole, and only if somebody just digs their heels in and won't do what you're asking them to do, do you take them to court or, or do, you, do you fine them? And that is the right way because small retailers in particular have huge burdens to, to face and we need to help them all we, we can. I just wondered, though, in the context of the fixed penalties, um, there's a big difference between a, a small corner shop and a big supermarket with all of the legal resources etc. that the supermarkets and others uh, have. And although having a fixed penalty is quite a useful thing and it's standard and everybody gets hit the same if they refuse to comply, the uh, effect of £100 on a major supermarket is obviously going to be less uh, than the effect of a nut bite on an elephant, um, whereas £100 to a small corner trader proportionately is much more. I just wondered if any thought had been given to variable fixed penalties, whereas if, we, if you did find 
that a large retailer was deliberately flouting and you couldn't persuade them to comply, that a larger fixed penalty could be applied, maybe based on turnover of the store or the business or floor area or something like that. I just wonder if that was considered, because otherwise £100 to a major retailer is not really a disincentive. It's a fair point you raise, and I you know, respect your experience as a former head of trading standards, so no doubt know a lot more about these things than many of us around the table here uh, today. I think the first point to make clear is that, and I will answer your questions, but clearly all the indications are that most retailers of all sizes, but particularly the bigger retailers, are on board and see it as a responsible thing to do to make sure they're abiding by the regulations and implementing it. And that's all the evidence we have so far. So the scenario of a major retailer with a reputation to protect, clearly in the, the high street, uh, would flout this, I think, rather remote, but quite clear it's a genuine question you ask. So the, the, to answer a couple of your, your points is that the figure of £200, of course, was um, agreed, particularly with local government, as a proportionate level. As you said yourself, it can be £100 if you pay early the fine. And it's also in line with the fixed penalties for tobacco legislation and fly tipping. And therefore, that's why that figure was mooted and agreed and pushed as the best option by local government in particular. In terms of <clears throat> the options available, well, clearly, if a large retailer, as you quite rightly say, which may have a turnover of millions of pounds, where to flout the regulations and break the law. The local authorities, of course, do have other options. And I think we would anticipate they may explore those other options as opposed to a £200 fine for a large retail chain in Scotland. So I just want to convey that there are other options there. Clearly, there's the criminal sanctions, which can either be up to £20,000 of fines or unlimited through indictment and through the, the, the process. So. I think that caters for all eventualities. But as I say, the indications just now are that major retailers in particular, who are the ones you're, you're highlighting, um, are abiding by the regulations. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mike Russell. <coughs> I think you right to point out uh, at the start of this the extraordinary success of the policy, and <coughs> policy I know you have long believed in, and, and I think you are quite entitled to feel very vindicated by that success, but it's a policy of behaviour change. And whilst I fully appreciate the need to, for enforcement from time to time, I did want to agree with Dave Thompson with his experience that it is the light touch that has made the difference. There is quite clear behaviour change taking place. I think most people are now embarrassed when they have to find themselves in a position of asking for a, a plastic bag, which was not the case before. And I certainly feel in that position myself when I'm foolish enough to go into a shop without a bag. So I, I was just seeking an assurance from you that the government's view is still that the best policy is that light touch and that you are seeking behaviour change and that, that, there will be, that local authorities will be encouraged to be restrained in their use of the legislation. Uh, it is sometimes the further you get from government, the, you know, the more confusing the message becomes. And I didn't want any authority to feel that they were obliged now to implement these uh, penalties in an enthusiastic way, but they would do so in a very restrained way. And that behaviour change, I think, is therefore more likely to be long-lasting in, in that way. Yes, and, and, and I welcome your comments about behaviour change, which, as you said yourself, is the main thrust of these regulations. And, of course, I think more of us are embarrassed when we forget to take our bags to the supermarkets or shops. Uh, you spoke of your own experience, and believe you me, that applies even more so to the Minister responsible for bringing this regulation before Parliament. Sometimes I feel like wearing a disguise when I realise I've forgotten to take my bags to the, the shops, but that, thankfully, is a rare occasion these days. Uh, so, yes, it is about behaviour change, and it is uh, making a difference. You're quite right. The light touch approach, as others have said, is the best way forward, clearly for the early stages of the policy. And clearly, if local authorities receive complaints from members of the public who feel strongly that they have been to a shop that's not charging for bags, then local authorities will act upon that and investigate but all the evidence at the moment. And the, the approach to it is to give advice. And clearly, I think, as Dave Thompson said, if over and over that advice is ignored, clearly the local authorities may have little option but to take some action. But that, I think, to answer your question, that the best long-term solution is to continue in that vein. Uh, this is not a money-making exercise. It's about raising cash for good causes where bags are 
uh, sold in our retailers. Uh, it's not money that comes to the government. Uh, and likewise, our local authorities want to adopt a light touch as well. And you will, you will, well, I hope, make that clear to each local authority in a, in a gentle but forceful way. Yes, we continue to work with uh, our local authorities to take a sensible approach and proportionate approach to this. But again, you know, if there are people out there who continually flout and do ignore the advice they're given, clearly we would expect local authorities to act on that as well. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, <coughs> the Cabinet Secretary will recall I opposed this measure when it first came in, um, but uh, put forward in mitigation perhaps a, a hope that I would be proved wrong at the end of the day. And, and the one thing I would say is it doesn't at all surprise me that there's been a huge drop in demand because in other countries where this has been introduced, that has been indeed the case. Uh, but in some countries, and I'm thinking particularly of Ireland, over, over a couple, two or three years, I think, the demand levels rose quite considerably again. And I just, um, I mean, I, I have no problem with what's being put forward in this instrument, and I absolutely agree with the, the, the continuation of the light touch approach as the right way forward. But should that demand start to rise again, and I think we all hope it doesn't, but should it do so, how do you then, um, how do you then use the light touch approach to, to try to, to stop that increase in demand, should that prove to be the case? Well, I think the previous conversation about the light touch approach was more to do with compliance, whereas I think your question is maybe more to do with if the behaviour change <laughs> over time is not as, as positive as what it is at the early stages of the policy. Well, hopefully, clearly, you know, that's not the case. I think I said to the committee before that, you know, we still will keep this under review as the years go by. And there are other options to revisit the legislation in terms of the, 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 minimum, the minimum charge in the first place. Should it be raised above five pence in the future if it's less impact of five pence? And also the, the kind, of, kind of materials the bags are, are made of or whatever. There's other ways in which the policy objectives could be pursued if in time if it turns out that we're not achieving what we want to achieve under the existing regulations. But thankfully that's not the case just now. There's no sign of that just now. You mentioned the experience in Ireland, but the experience, there's many, many countries have put this into place. And in, in the main, I'm only aware of positive stories, but we will, of course, keep this under review. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, it's good to know that from humble backbenchers to cabinet secretaries that uh, we are in touch with the realities of life by doing the shopping or the messages, depending on which part of Scotland you come from. Uh, and that's good to know. I just wonder whether the cabinet secretary uh, might have a thought about uh, the designated charities that some of the supermarkets have chosen, because we did raise the question about uh, them being environmentally uh, linked and in some of these announcements, they do not seem to be. Many of the charities chosen do have an environmental uh, role to play in our society and communities. But you may recall that one of the debates we had was that some retailers had existing relationships and we didn't want to disturb those if they wanted to increase the donations we're giving to existing recipients as a result of the, 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 the charge. We didn't feel that the regulation should exclude that. So therefore, we clearly gave an indication and urged within the regulations that good causes should include or could include environmental causes. And as I said, many retailers, I think Tesco, for instance, are uh, supporting um, Keep Scotland Beautiful. And other retailers as well are supporting some environmental causes. So there's hopefully millions of pounds are going to go towards good environmental causes in Scotland that wasn't there previously. Thank you for that. Are there no further comments just now, then we'll move seamlessly on to agenda item three. And the third item of the agenda today is to consider the motion S4M 12647, asking for the committee to recommend approval of the affirmative instrument single use carrier bags charge fixed penalty notices and amendment Scotland Regulations 2015 draft. The motion will be moved and there's an opportunity for formal debate. And uh, as you know, it's only a matter for uh, the politicians in the committee and the cabinet secretary to speak if need be, uh, not officials. Uh, so I invite the cabinet secretary to speak and move the motion. Well, thank you very much for the, the questions from the committee. They're all very, very relevant questions. And I think it's fair to say, I think we all warmly welcome the progress that has been made so far. 
And without further ado, I would just say that I want to formally move the, the motion. Uh, are there any members who wish to comment at this stage? There are no members who wish to comment. So, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, any kind of wind-up that you feel you have to say? Just to thank the committee for their cooperation. <laughs> okay. Well, I put the question on the motion, and the question is that uh, motion S4M 12647, in the name of Richard Lockhead, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. So we record the result that the committee's report will confirm the outcome of this debate. Thank Richard Lockhead and his official just now. Uh, we'll move to subordinate legislation agenda item four. Uh, this is uh, for consideration of the Common Agriculture Policy Direct Payments etc. Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-58. And uh, the committee previously considered this instrument the 4th of March and elected to write the Scottish Government on the instrument. We now have received that response. I refer members to the paper and invite comments from the committee. Members. Alec Ferguson. Uh, convener, and, and um, uh, again, um, can I just thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Government? Yes. <laughs> for um, uh, too late, but I, I, I wanted to commend the, the Cabinet Secretary for the steps that he's taken here, uh, in particular to give us the assurance that in, in introducing a further statutory instrument to sort of correct this error, if I could put it that way, uh, that no uh, farmers who have taken action so far will be disadvantaged or penalised in any way. I think that's the assurance we were all hoping would be there. It is there, and therefore I am um, very happy with the changes or the, the, the action that's been proposed. Uh, anyone else want to comment? <coughs> if not, uh, then is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any further recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. We are agreed. Yeah. So there will now be a short suspension to allow witnesses to take their seats for the next agenda item.
the fifth item today is the government, Scottish Government's <coughs> biodiversity strategy. And uh, this is a chance for our committee to take oral evidence on the implementation of the Scottish Government's strategy. We <coughs> are joined by a panel of stakeholders, and I welcome everyone to the meeting. <coughs> I'll ask you just to introduce yourself, um, to say who you are, uh, not to make a statement about uh, your interests. We'll move to the questions, and I'm sure that you'll all be able to come in easily by indicating to me, and I will keep a list of those who want to speak. It doesn't mean you all have to speak on every point, because um, there are only 24 hours in the day. But uh, we can go round just now, uh, first of all, by introducing yourself, James Davidson, you are. Um, James Davidson, I'm the Project Officer for the Aberdeenshire Land Use Strategy Pilot, and I work for Aberdeenshire Council. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Boyack, MSP for Lothian. Uh, Rob Brooker, I'm a plant ecologist at the James Hutton Institute. Thank you. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP for Skylach Aberdeen and Badenoch. From Badenoch, depends where you come from. Simon Jones, I'm a Director of Conservation at the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Uh, Grant Moore, Chief Executive, Cairngorms National Park Authority. MSP for a girl in Butte. Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Derek Robson, Tweed Forum, working on integrated land and water management projects. Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. Sue Mars, Scottish Natural Heritage and Trends and Indicators Advice. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Uh, Chris Nixon, Environment Manager with Forest Enterprise Scotland. Uh, Graeme Day, MSP Angus South. And I'm the convener, Rob Gibson, MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. I uh, want to kick off just with a kind of general question because the, the kind of uh, the tenor of discussions about the ability to reach targets and so on in about 2020 uh, is one of, uh, I shouldn't say gloom, but a degree of uh, concern. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would like to see what the panel think about uh, the current work on the biodiversity targets or the challenge uh, that there is in Scotland to meet these. Are we on course to meet uh, our targets? And if not, why not? So who wants to kick off? Derek Robson, I think. So. I think we're probably not on target to, to, to uh, reach our biodiversity challenges probably for a number of reasons. Um, we work a lot with farmers and, and landowners in the borders countryside, and we see a lot of real willingness to, to, to try and deliver these biodiversity challenges and targets ahead, but I think they all feel that incentives are not necessarily there, and uh, this needs to be driven by incentivisation um, as much as anything else. So they are really willing and keen to do this biodiversity work, but incentives need to, need to be there. And they need to work in collaboration, the collaboration element of delivery of biodiversity targets in the wider countryside needs to be brought more to the fore. And that does depend on having a healthy and efficient and workable advisory service. So we do feel that facilitation to help these farmers and land managers work uh, to deliver these targets would be a real boost. So incentivisation and advice um, is, is a real, would be a real boost to delivery. Respect that the, the greening proposals in the CAP, for example, are a major incentive, indeed one which is funded. They are as good as far as they go, but they don't probably go far enough, in truth. And I think most would recognise that they don't, are probably not going to deliver the step change uh, for biodiversity that we are really looking for. Um, they are good, but we need more of a choice. We'll get some views from around other parts of Scotland as well, but Mike Russell wanted a supplementary. Yeah, I, think, I think what we heard from Derek probably gets immediately to the nub of the matter. Incentivisation is all very well, but surely there is an imperative for everybody who's involved in working in the environment to ensuring it continues to exist in the most healthy way possible. That's a core part of anybody's business or activity. So to expect to be paid, or always paid, to do the things that you have to do in order to allow you to continue to do them strikes me as, as really quite an important part of this. The, the state will not be able to pay forever for these things to be done, but it is important they continue to be done. So when do we, when do we ingest those 
as part of our core activity and not expect them to be added on and for something extra to be given for them. That's, that's a key issue for me. Uh, yes, Rob uh, Bricker. So there was, a, um, there was a very interesting lunchtime seminar in here during Scottish Environment Week, which was about agroecology and um, looking at the benefits that biodiversity can bring to food production systems. And I think what we're starting to do now is see the opportunities that might be brought by integrating biodiversity back into the system. So a lot of the intensive management systems maintain food production whilst soil biodiversity, for example, is in decline. But if we're looking at a more variable climate, for example, moving through time or um, loss of pollinators from the system, as we're seeing in many places at the moment, we can start to look at the broader benefits from, from biodiversity and agricultural systems. And then from that, start to calculate how they would offset the potential costs of switching to a more sustainable management uh, opportunity. So I think there's a lot of work in that area at the moment. Perhaps one of the big challenges we have is in linking up the people that need to know the information with the people that are doing those areas of research and trying to implement it. So I think that's, that's a major challenge at the moment. If we were starting fresh in this matter, if we were starting from nowhere, there is at least an argument, say, what we would do is fine people for not operating in a, a, an environmentally sustainable way. Now, I'm not saying we should do that, but, you know, you could turn this on its head and say, arriving from another planet, people would think it was rather odd that we were paying people to save the planet, where in actual fact we should be trying to stop them from destroying the planet. Well, yes, you might be able to say that. I think that's not unreasonable. I think what we, it comes back to, though, is the incentive structures which are in place. So, historically, what we've had is systems which are promoted, which are highly productive in terms of a single outcome, which is food production. And we haven't looked more widely at the other benefits that farming can bring. Um, and I think there needs to... If, well, part of that step change is, is to switch from one way of incentivising people to another way of incentivising people. So, to look at the broader benefits. Well, from the panel, and then Alec Ferguson. So Grant Moyer and Simon Jones. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I'm not sure it's just about government incentives um, and agro-environment payments and things like that. I mean, I, I think it's a question of how or what we put our priorities into. So if you look at something like um, peatland restoration in the uplands, um, there's a payoff in terms of that, in terms of what you might then have to do through Scotch water uh, further downstream in terms of cleaning water, etc. There's flood benefits. There, there's a whole range of things. So it's where we're actually putting money to do what and why. So do you build things downstream or do you pay for it in the uplands? And I think actually there's some choices that we've got to make as a country as to where you then put your money, if you like, on those things. So it isn't so much about the incentive regime that we have through CAP and all the rest of it. It's actually about where we want to put some of our infrastructure money, where we want to put some of our... Um, our other funding into things that you'd probably put on the softer side than the harder side of engineering and such like. And I think there's an awful lot more that we could probably do in the uplands. There's probably more work, uh, if you certainly look in other countries around the world. Um, there's some fantastic examples of natural flood management systems where huge amounts of money were put into the uplands for certain things that have led to great benefits for cities, etc., further downstream. And I think there's probably more work to be done on that in Scotland than where we currently are. No, I, I think I, w I would agree that incentives aren't the only tool, tool in the armoury and obviously regulation has a role to play a, a, as well, even as best as possible it should be light touch. I, I, th I think to go back to your original question, I, I would agree with, with Derek that we're probably not on target to hit, hit, hit all the targets. I think we've certainly made steps in the right direction and a lot of good work has we're focused on the process of the biodiversity strategy and the challenge. I think we're now at a point where implementation is really, we're starting to question, question that's right. And I, I suppose I would make the point that I think underlying this is, uh, as well as incentive, as well as regulation, is, is a clear, compelling vision. It's something to allow everybody to be, to be crystal clear of where we want, want to go. And that means illustrating a place that Scotland wants to be in relation to its biodiversity. I think we have, we have good messages in relation to that, but I think clarity for, for example, landowners, for local authorities and for stakeholders is, is really giving them good, good illustrations and good comparisons to say this is where we want to move to by, by 2020. So I've heard about the vision, certainly. Uh, you're all right with that. Um, other members of the uh, panel wish to speak at all, but we'll come back to you in a minute because you bravely kicked off a good debate. Uh, Yes, Chris Nixon. 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Convener. <coughs> um, it's just to, I guess, pick up the point about the, the kind of focus of work on biodiversity and, and uh, the integration between different different land uses and, and uh, neighbours and uh, to, to focus effort. I think there, you know, there are occasions where work is undertaken for biodiversity and it's you know maybe not in as, as a well integrated way as, as it as it could be and that and that leads to a certain level of inefficiency so in terms of the kind of structures that are in place to support the achievement of the goals then 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 you know um, encouraging that that level of integration i think is important james davidson i just, I just probably like to highlight perhaps you know, there's, there's considerable progress being made, I think, on achieving biodiversity targets, and there are a number of sectors kind of well engaged. The public sector are well engaged. You know, land managers, farmers, etc., are, are engaged through incentives, through rules, through through regulation, etc. The public are perhaps becoming increasingly engaged. There's still quite a way to go, but but there are, are actors kind of missing in the debate, really. I think, and and I think private business, while there are many kind of sort of good news stories, there's quite a gap there in terms of, of private business, private enterprise, you know, beyond the land management, the primary production sector being involved in this, and um, being aware of their impacts on biodiversity, being aware of what they can do to improve biodiversity a lot. So I think that's where we need to consider, you know, further targeted effort and work to see how we can engage them within the process and, and to unlock, you know, the good work that they really could do for biodiversity. Uh, Sue Mars. Um, I'd like to comment. I think you know, we acknowledged in our 2010 report on the state of biodiversity that we have made good progress, but nobody hit the 2010 targets of halting biodiversity loss, which is a very challenging one. Um, one of the issues we need to address is to move away from looking at individual species and individual habitats and moving towards a sort of joined up ecosystems approach to how we manage our whole countryside and you can see that coming through with the, the Aberdeen pilot and the land use strategy and, and these types of work so I think Scotland's doing really good work in this direction um, and would like to like it to continue really so we're making progress but there's still a lot to do. Um, okay that's a, that's a good start just now I think we've got the context about a vision uh, and how we actually articulate that but we also have to recognize probably that there's a wider approach to a systems and ecosystems approach well we'll dig into some of the questions now uh, but um, before I come to what was our question two I think one that follows on is our question 10 uh, which Graham Day is going to uh, ask you. Thank you, Kavir. Good morning uh, to the witnesses. I, I just wonder if there's a clear enough understanding of who's respo where responsibility for delivery on biodiversity actually lies, and is mainstreaming of biodiversity throughout Scottish government departments, local authorities and other public bodies happening to a sufficient degree? I, mean, I can speak to that in the Cairn Gorms. Um, in terms of the Cairn Gorms National Park, there's a wide partnership that's behind Cairn Gorms Nature, uh, which covers off um, that whole sort of range of people involved from public sector, private sector, NGOs, etc. Um, and they have, what we've done is to take the targets from the 2020 strategy and say what are those within the Cairn Gorms and how are we going to deliver them. So I actually think it is pretty clear as to what we've got to do. So as it clears to what we've got to do, the bit that we've really got to then say is, well, how are we going to do that? Because, you know, we've got a target of 2,000 hectares of peatland restoration, or we've got a target of 5,000 hectares of native woodland expansion. So then it's a case of going out, talking with people, and actually making that happen on the ground. And it is at that landscape scale side of things. But I think in where we've got good spatially defined priorities in parts of Scotland, I think it works. And I think the land use pro uh, strategy um, pilots show that as well, that where we've actually taken stuff at national level and then focus it down and said this is what we've got to do here I think it works where it's more we're just implementing the national targets I think that gets a little bit more tricky so I, I can only talk about the Cairn Gorms specifically and Loch Lomond a bit but in terms of those places I think you do have a good way of bringing everyone together and it's potentially a model that can be used in other places it's not just applicable to national parks. So is the Tweed Forum a bit like that? We are, we are and we work in a local, level, in a local partnership um, 
I mean, we think, we think to deliver biodiversity, it needs to run on, on three levels. You've got the ethical and moral argument that we should all be doing this because it's the right thing to do. You've got the cross-compliance argument, the regulator argument that, it, that is in place. But you've also got, if money is tight and money is, is, is a key objective very often, then we do need to start targeting. And we are working like Aberdeenshire on the Scottish Borders Land Use Strategy Pilot. We have target maps which are indicative of where work could be done. So we are thinking that that is probably the best way to go to try and work with partners in these areas um, to deliver these objectives. So we think targeting of resources, working in partnerships, local forum to deliver these partnerships, and maybe ring fencing of budgets regionally so that local priorities can be set, so that national targets come down to local targets and delivered locally, that that model would probably work better going forward. Yes, Grant Moyer, and then... Simon Long, uh, Simon Jones, you wanted to come in, I think. Yeah, just to come, just come back and I just to give an example of that in that um, we've done a lot of work within the park, that, again, across the Cairns Nature Partnership, which is looking at native woodland expansion. On the back of that, we produced targeting maps, which then Forest Commission have used to, um, use to put forward incentives within the park of an extra 10% on um, the payment rates within the park for those places where we want to see native woodland expansion. So there's a way of actually, if you like, using the information we collected across the partnership to then use that to influence the incentive. So I think actually that's been a, a good use of how public sector has joined up to actually try to deliver the biodiversity targets. Simon Luck Jones. Thanks, Thanks convener. And, and I'd agree that d delivery is so much, it's easy to say it's, it's down to everybody. It's all our responsibility. And of course it is, but I think government and ag agencies really need to, to lead the way and set lead by example. I, I, was, I was talking with, with Chris actually when, on the way this morning, the importance of sort of big data and remote sensing and how in the future, if we're talking about biodiversity and natural resources at landscape scale, then you really need to see it from an, e an eagle eye view from above. And, and I think an, an investment, a continuation investment in, in big data and remote sensing can help really lead the way to provide the data to make the decisions on. I think on the ground, we, we would say the sort of the right scale of delivery and responsibility rests at the kind of the, the catchment scale. That's, that's, we believe, the planning unit that's, that's effective. You can look at water quality at the catchment scale, and there's a lot's been achieved there. Uh, deer management groups, you know, in the future, could such a thing evolve to be land and water management groups operating at a, at a catchment level? So you involve whoever you need to involve a local stakeholder, an agency, and government level within a, in an appropriate scale. So I think, uh, I think gra grassroots is, is very important, but let's look, not lose the emphasis that, that government and agencies need to, need to lay, lay, lead the way here with, with the approach. Several people want to come in on this, so uh, uh, Rob Brooker first. Um, I was just to make a point in the uh, SBS um, refresh, the uh, 2020 challenge document, a, a lot of the focus was on picking priority areas for action and getting coordinated work across agencies. Um, and that's why the ecosystem health indicators have been developed. And one of the explicit things about those is that they are downscalable so that you can focus your activities collectively in certain areas. And that's also a large part of the research which is being um, proposed under the next strategic research program to develop better indicators for focusing action and also mechanisms for bringing people together to work collectively. So that idea of focusing resources and focusing effort on priority areas is, is a key part of the existing documentation, but also the work that's going to be done moving forward. And James uh, Davidson. Um, I mean, just to pick up on Grant Moyer's point, really, I mean, they have Kieran Gorm's Nature in, in North East Scotland. We have the North East Scotland Biodiversity Partnership, so essentially our local biodiversity action plan process, which does a tremendous amount of, of good work. But, I mean, in terms of delivery, and uh, I believe there's a little bit of a disconnect between kind of the national biodiversity process and local biodiversity action plans now, and, and that relationship needs to be strengthened and a bit more direction coming from, from the national process down to the local biodiversity action planning process. And uh, to come back to uh, it's Sue, Sue Mars, yes. Um, thank you for that. It's just in, in response to that, a lot of the reporting mechanisms that we've used up until now have been at the national level because that's what we've got the best data set for. But that does make it very difficult to, as James says, to lead into action on the ground. So it's why we're working on trying to develop um, more 
smaller resolution indicators, the national ecosystem health indicators, um, and other indicators where we're actually looking at a local level so we can actually see what's happening in specific areas to move away from a more general picture across Scotland, which is a hugely diverse country, to um, actual what we can actually deliver and do on the ground and where we can focus effort. Um, Are we close to being able to provide a cat river catchment area, for example? I think there's still quite a lot of work to do, I'm afraid. So that's um, years ahead, possibly? Yeah. Well, in terms of producing indicators, we're possibly a distance away, but I think there's a lot of initiatives around Scotland where people know um, what's needing to be done. So, for example, like the the um, land use strategy trials and the national parks. These people know what needs to be done, um, I think. Uh, Chris Nixon. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's just to follow up on the point about um, uh, having a good understanding of, of um, uh, sites and, and priorities. And, and uh, certainly on the National Forest Estate, we've under, uh, undertaken and asked are undertaking... Um, quite large survey programs looking at, for instance, open habitats. Um, and we've also had recently the Native Woodland Survey of Scotland, which have produced you know, quite um, significant data sets and information, which are then um, you know, extremely valuable, extremely useful in, in targeting efforts. So I, I just really to, to raise that, that point that, that there needs to be a, a you know, a, a fair degree of um, focus on on uh, on gathering the information, which would enable us to target um, uh, our efforts uh, effectively. Okay, that's a lot of information, um, Mike. I think I'm going to leave your question till a little later, when you have got time to follow up, because the next question kind of follows on from this, which is basically about the landscape scale projects and their impact on ecological health and the lessons that can be learned from these projects. You know, is there evidence that projects like this are making a real difference to biodiversity in Scotland? Um, I know from the infant uh, status of uh, the coal project in my own constituency, Coyach uh, and Ascent Living Landscape, that, uh, you know, this is a 50-year time horizon. Is this the kind of thing that's going to be capable of delivering targets, but at the same time actually making a difference to biodiversity? So who wants to kick off about landscape scale ones? Right, Simon Jones. Convener, maybe I'll, I'll join you, because uh, obviously the Wildlife Trust are main, main partners in the Koyagak and Ascent Living Landscape. To go back to the, to the data issue, I... I think we, we need to be better at data, and there's a lot already out there. The, the local scale, what it gives us is how directly that affects people's lives and how they see at a local level how the, d the delivery of 2012 and Challenge, which means nothing to the residents of Koigak and Ascent, obviously. They, they, they don't give a stuff about it particularly. What they want to know is how they might be involved, involved in still economically making a living off the land while not continuing to degrade the ecosystems in, in the area through through woodland expansion. I, I think the point being, it, it is a slow burner, and with the right level of support, so for example, woodland expansion is a good example in the north, in the northwestern Koyak and Ascent, how actually targeted resource can make a big difference in quite a small amount of time. The process of getting everybody together and building up respect amongst the various stakeholders is the one that takes the longest period of, of, of time, really, in terms of action on the ground. There are some quick wins, I think, in terms of dealing with some of the key threats, which is part of the messaging that I believe the, the, the 2020 challenge needs to be clearer on. What are the key threats that we need to overcome if we're to, to start making significant catchment level biodiversity improvements? I mean, that's just one uh, area, but, uh, you know, the, the, the involvement of the human element in uh, the whole process is the thing that attracts me to the living landscape, that uh, it's a landscape in which you need to have humans in order for there to be any proper biodiversity. So if the communities are fragile, the way in which we use the resources of uh, nature have to be targeted in order to make sure that there will be humans there 
in the next 50 years to actually take these things forward. So, you know, when you say that people um, perhaps are not looking initially at what might happen in that time, but to be able to uh, continue to make a living there, uh, you know, is that built into the, the way in which we see biodiversity at this landscape scale enough for people to feel ownership of it? If I could respond to that, I, I think we need to maybe challenge some of the, the wide-scale management and land use cultures that we have because you know, the, 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 the successful future, particularly of the uplands and, and the coast, is, is built on successful communities. There's a re, there are resources there that need to be used. I suppose what we'd like to see is is a more sympathetic management, more rather than mono kind of cultural approaches to forestry, to agriculture, to fishery farming, more integration so that there is still a healthy hunting industry, there's still a healthy farming, but there's much more integration between those things. SRDP, I think, through a process of evolution, needs to reflect that and through incentives, as we talked about. If we want to see the landscape change and still support people and see ecosystem benefits, then we need to incentivise a shift, a transition in that. And the SRDP, for example, has got, I think, an important role, role to play in that because people will always look for the, the pound sign connected to any reason why they should change their current activity. Trawler fishermen, creel fishermen, foresters, hunters are a good example. Sue Myers. Um, what I'm going to say follows on directly from what um, you said yourself, and that was that the, one of the advantages of the ecosystems approach is that it puts people very much within, as part of the environment, rather than having humans and the environment as separate entities, and it acknowledges that we are part of the process. And one of the things I think we really need to do when we're um, working with these landscape scale projects is we really need to bring people, members of the public, on board with us and communicate why is it important that farmland waders are going down? Why does it matter to individuals? And so going back to your discussion about polythene bags, it's almost about, it's about bringing around behavioural change and getting people to understand that, not understand, but take the time to acknowledge that by looking after their environment, they're also looking after themselves and, and their future. Um, and that, Graham Day wanted a supplementary on that point. Yeah, just to pick up on that, and of course, the thing about carrier bags is people are now being charged for carrier bags, which perhaps goes back to Mike Russell's earlier point. When, and when Simon Jones talked about the pound sign coming into play, wouldn't it come into play if, in the form of penalties for people who didn't do the right things in terms of biodiversity? Personally, I, I, I still think the uh, regulations should be, should be light touch I think you have to, you reach a point where penalties are, are useful, but in some respects you've, you've kind of lost the argument already at that point. If, if people don't understand the real value of natural capital, then clearly they still haven't got it, and we're not doing a good enough job of telling them about the importance of natural capital. So penalties, I think, come, come later, but it's, you know, it's an educational process, and, and I think Sue makes a good point that, and I'd say the, the sensible unit for engaging with local people and why it matters to them is still the local catchment, whether it be the deer management group or the local village or the living landscape, because then it really matters to those people who might not be interested in government strategy. Uh, Grant Moyer? Um, I, I mean, I think this is um, fairly crucial to, to all this. I mean, I, I, my general feeling is that over the past 20 years, we've, we've reached a point where we've got, got a lot of the low-hanging hang, fruit associated with biodiversity, and we've done a lot of good work on the fringes of a lot of these big issues. And if we're going to meet the targets that are set for us in the 2020 challenge and, and beyond, and on these long-term 50-year time horizons, actually we get into the really tricky issues, um, the ones that we've all talked about for many years but haven't quite nailed. Um, so things like deer management, things like um, upland grouse management, things like um, where does development go, da, da, da. there's a whole range of things which, um, how do we integrate agriculture and forestry 
because um, we talk about it and we continue to, to talk about it and we all think it's a good idea, but we continue to struggle to do so. Um, and I think that's where the real big gains, and it is at a landscape scale and it is about involving people, but it's actually about tackling some of these really big, tricky issues, which when you look at the priorities um, and where people are, have their businesses and how they're set up will mean change, which ne not necessarily they will want to do. So there is a whole question of if people don't want to do it, and it's not being led through incentives, how do you make it happen? And I think there are some, some pretty um, tricky questions for a government, for NGOs, for, for us all, about what are the things that you actually have to put in place. And I agree it is about trying to get people, convince people to actually do it. Um, but there is a point of saying, well, if they're not, how do you, how do you move on from that? From a voluntary carbon audit on farms, if necessary, to a compulsory one, you know, which has been kind of agreed in this round of cap, so we are in a process of saying we're going to have to move in that direction in order to deal with the, the carbon output. And that therefore, you know, in ter terms of landscape use, whether it's farming, forestry, we need to probably be moving a bit in that direction. Incentives are one side of it, but, you know, there are imperatives about the climate, for example, and biodiversity. These are objective factors that we need to take into account. So Derek wants to speak, and then Chris, and then Rob, and then uh, uh, that order. Right. Thank you, Mr. Convener. I'd just like to come back to your point about um, bringing people with you on this process, that biodiversity is as much about habitat management um, and species management, but it's really it's about people management as well. People have to come along on, on this journey. And through the Land Use Strategy Pilot that we've been working with on, with Dundee University and Scottish Borders Council, we've been going into the subcatchments of the River Tweed, up some of these valleys, and sitting down with the farmers and the wider stakeholders, the wider communities. We've been really encouraged about um, speaking with, to them about their problems and their issues, about the challenges and opportunities going forward for land use in these valleys. So it is fundamental to get people on board with this because the, the solutions will come from the ground up yeah. because these are the people that are living and working and having to deal with land use in these valleys and forestry, farming, conservation, all these challenges, all these drivers have to be, the solutions have to almost be found locally and, and, and worked on locally. But the incentives have to come from above. The mechanisms have to come from above, but delivery has to come come from the local from the local areas. And the solutions are there, but the incentives have to be there to follow them through. So, Chris, first, and then Rob. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted really to to support that point, and 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 just just to raise raise the issue of coordination, um, and and also timing of action, um, in engaging people. And an example. Um, <clears throat> which we're heavily involved in, um, again, on the National Forest Estate, is, is rhododendron control as an invasive species. And, and that, that's a good example where um, um, it, we have a large program on the National Forest Estate, and there are large, large uh, programs happening elsewhere. But if it's not coordinated and timed uh, in, in a way which avoids re-invasion uh, of rhododendron, just as an example, then a lot of the a lot of the effort is lost because it's not well coordinated. And I think in engaging people on a landscape level, then coordinating effort and timing of effort can be can be very important. Yes, who's monitoring fires of uh, rhododendron clearance in some parts of my West Coast constituency at the moment would be a very interesting question. Um, anyway, uh, we've uh, got Rob, first of all, and then James. I, just, I think from a research perspective, we're in a much better place than we were maybe four or five years ago with respect to handling some of these issues because the focus on the ecosystem approach has made a whole range of different research areas come together. So ecologists are working with environmental economists and social scientists. We have a much better understanding of the wide breadth of benefits that we get from natural capital in the environment, but also the challenges with respect to managing those things. And we, we're starting to view these systems, ecologists would see them as collections of organisms, but now we're what we call joined socio-ecological systems. So people are part of the environment, and that's, that's the key thing. We, we know this is key. We know this is key to the management uh, discussions. Um, now our challenge is to continue these discussions. The land use pilots have been brilliant in terms of bringing a whole suite of people together, including researchers, to talk to land managers and look for ways forwards. Um, I chair the science and technical group for the SBS, and we run a biodiversity science conference. And one of the 
things that comes back in terms of the feedback from that is it's one of the few fora <coughs> for land managers and policy people and researchers to all get together. It's almost less about the presentations and more about the networking opportunities. And that, I think, is where we could benefit. A, a, a centre of expertise on ecosystems, for example, could be that forum for bringing people together. And we have, we're developing techniques um, such as in uh, conservation conflict resolution where we are uh, developing ways to get everybody in a room to talk together to try and find a way forward in terms of managing the environment that benefits those people that have to live in that environment. So I think we're in, we're in a good place from a research point of view. The key thing now is making the links between the different people that need help and information. How does that relate to community planning partnerships? Um, I think we need, well, for example, from the point of view for the ecologists, we need to make better connections to the planners. So I think the land use pilots have been a great opportunity to do that and to test that out. And um, so, for example, part of the work that's proposed for the next strategic research program is about biodiversity offsetting, and that's clearly going to have to link through to the planning system. So that's an area where we, we need to develop better communications and understand the problems better. Uh, James Davidson, you're involved in Aberdeenshire, perhaps, in this interview. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I, I, just, I just wanted to kind of make the point, really, and kind of observe that those kind of harder-to-reach fruit that, that Grant kind of outlined, you know, renewables, upland management, integration of forestry and farming, kind of were the work of the pilots in a lot of ways. Those r challenging rural land management issues, and I'm not going to pretend we've come up with all the answers, and I, I don't think Derek would either, but I think what we found is that there's a really strong appetite for integration out there, genuinely. You know, people assume there's kind of hostility between these different sectoral interests, but there genuinely is an appetite for integration, and we found that there, there can be real benefits in pursuing this, and I think there's also real benefits in us getting a bit more explicit, kind of spatially, about where we expect things to happen, where things can happen that are going to deliver maximum benefit, and where, if things happen in certain areas, it, it would deliver disbenefits. Um, and we've started that in both the land use strategy pilot areas, and I think that's really a direction we need to pursue. Um, you mentioned community planning, and I'm kind of moving on here a little bit in a sense, but, but um, it's, it's, it's something we've, we've, we've had a little bit of involved in with the pilot. Um, but we, we kind of note that their eye on the environment is not as great as it might be. I think in terms of indicators the community planning use, their indicators are social, they're economic. They're not quite so focused on environmental indicators. And there is, I think, an open door there. And we're starting to pursue it in Aberdeenshire to try and get them to have a greater eye on environmental issues, along with the very important social and economic ones they have to deal with. That's interesting. And uh, looked at in a historical sense, uh, it's understandable about why that went off beam when community planning partnerships are set up as they were. But I'll not go into that just now. I will at great length another point. But Sarah Boyack wants to come in uh, just at this moment. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Um, just as a few things have been said about the the local and getting the scale right and getting people to either network or to commit to or understand what we need to do to deliver biodiversity. We've got biodiversity action plans with most local authorities, but not all. I think 25. You've got two pilots that have been done that have come up with good ideas. And then you've got local authority development plans. We have got lots of different tools that potentially address some of the problems that have been identified here in terms of habitat loss or development that's inappropriate. Um, who should be the key player in terms of leading this stuff? And it, it comes back a few times about who's meant to be pushing for this. Um, do the pilots tell us what you would need to do to make this work? And how much does it cost to make us do it? We have ideas, I think, as you say. I mean, the interesting thing about the pilots is it's been a really broad church in terms of its its involvement. And so, in many ways, it's quite difficult for us to push a single kind of idea forward because we represent such a diverse view. But I think what we have found is that we, we do have these mechanisms in place. You mentioned um, local development planning, the strategic development planning on kind of a wider scale. We've, we've got LBAPs. Um, but I still believe in terms of, and our focus was rural land management very explicitly, um, I still believe there is a gap there in terms of oversight across the rural land management piece. 
a forum for people to come together to discuss the issues and for some sort of directionality to be given. And what the pilots have done is try and create something very high level. That process is like local development planning, LBAP, catchment management planning, natural flood management planning, forestry planning, can grab hold of and say, okay, well, this looks like it's a priority. This looks like it would be um, undesirable and move forward from there. So there's still a gap, I think, for something overarching. Uh, Simon Law, uh, Jones and then Dave Thompson is going to take the questions forward. Fine. Thanks, Convene. Apologies, I feel like uh, you've been talking a lot. You've asked us in to talk and you probably yeah, regret it now already. Um, I, I think the, the, we've hit the nail on the head really with talking about at a local level. What's, what's the cost of making these changes? What's the, the, the real situation of, of, of this transition to something different, which is we want? And, I, and I'd argue we're really aren't going to make big steps in ecosystem restoration unless we address some of the big key threats, as, as Grant said. I mean, really, you know, we're talking about Mewburn, grouse management as it currently uh, exists, de the, the threat of deer. Unless you fundamentally find a way of dealing with these big, big threats, certainly in the uplands, then you're not going to make big, big changes uh, in, in the ecosystem. So if you decide, okay, then, well, well, what do we want in those areas in the future, get back to this compelling vision, then through policy, and through natural capital valuation and through regulation, it's about that process of transition from, from where we are now to where we want to be in, in the future. And I think the pilots have been useful for that, and the living landscapes and futurescapes are, are useful for that. Uh, but I, I think it's, a, it's about dr driving forward that, that, what, that the current the status quo is not going to keep our biodiversity and ecosystems in good enough state. We need to transition to a different way in many areas. Sumar? It was just, uh, I was just reflecting when people were speaking, and you can ask how much these processes cost to put in place, but if you've got unintegrated land management, and for example, I suppose an easy example is lowland flooding, because your uplands aren't in good condition, um, how much is it costing us not to do this kind of work? And I think that might be a, a more challenging question because I think you know, it's going to cost to do stuff, but it's, there's also a cost of not doing stuff. And I think that's, that's really quite an important nettle to grasp. I think we'll take this forward a little bit just now so that uh, uh, we will look at some of the details of upland management and so on later. But uh, I think uh, Dave Thompson wants to try and, uh, in fact, take up a point that uh, Rob Brooker raised. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. It's been very interesting actually listening to this discussion and uh, we do want you here to talk, Simon. I, the more you talk, the better, I, I, I think. But the, the talk about how we deal with this, uh, Simon mentioned actually local, local action and so on. But really what we've been talking about up until now are crofts, farms, estates and how we, <coughs> we deal with these and, and sort of local there. But if you actually look really local, if we're going to deal with diversity. If you look at the, the graph in terms of the Natural Capital Asset uh, Index, back in 1950, one year after I was born, it was very high, and it has halved uh, up until 2010. I'd be interested, first of all, to know if that has improved since 2010, because that was five years ago, so I don't know if Rob or anyone else can help us with that. That's the first point. But the second point, and maybe a more important one, is that I was born in a house in Lossiemouth, in Murray Street, which had a bit of ground behind it. And this was planned by the burghers of Elgin when they built this new part of Lossiemouth, 60 feet wide and 180 feet back to the next street. And every house in that area was exactly the same. And it was done quite deliberately. That was to allow people to grow their own food to keep chickens and all the rest of it. And our garden was full. My, my father was a baker. He would start at three in the morning. He would come home uh, midday, have a wee snooze, and he'd go out in the afternoon and evening and he'd work his garden and he would grow lots of stuff, as did many of our neighbours. Now, that would have added considerably to the high natural uh, capital value in 1950, because lots of people, individuals, were doing that. It wasn't just farmers and crofters and estate owners that were doing it. So we need to try to get back 
to have that kind of effect again. And the way to do it, I think, and it's something I, I would value comment on, is to get youngsters interested in gardening and horticulture at an early age. Now, this is a real problem at the moment. There's a fantastic little unit in Lochaber, um, the Lochaber, uh, the Rural Educational Trust, run by Isabel and Linda Campbell, um, out at uh, Anach Moor, and they take youngsters out, they take schools out, and they get them interested in growing things and animals and all the rest of it. That little uh, charitable organization struggles to get any kind of funding. We've been trying to help them, but we just can't source funding. And if they don't get funding, they'll close down. Now, my way of thinking is there's, there's lots of money out there, and SRDP and all that, and maybe it's not as much as everyone would like, and we know there's big cuts and everything. But why aren't we diverting some of the funds down to the Rural Education Trust in Lough Arbor, to schools that actually encourage youngsters to grow? Because if you could get people back to growing their own, even if it was only hobby to get a better quality of veg or whatever, you would have a massive army of people all across the country, and they would add to the natural uh, capital asset of, of, of the country. So it's really to, to get views of the panellists and maybe you're at a different level and you haven't really thought about this micro level, uh, but I, I would appreciate your views and also comment on whether things have improved or got worse since 2010. Rob? Um, yeah, so with respect to the Natural Capital Asset Index, I, I must admit I'm looking over your shoulder at the graph, but it, I think it comes down from about 118 uh, to, to 100, so it sort of drops by about the fifth. Um, my understanding is since that calculation was done, it's relatively stable, although there's going to be a revised version of the NCAI out this year, um, which will pull in new data, so it'll be robust, ro more robust. So I think it's stable at the moment. To go on to the issue of connecting kids with their environment through, for example, gardening, um, what we're seeing with the expansion of our thinking by taking an ecosystem approach is the importance of urban areas for a whole range of things. So if you look at pollinators, for example, the evidence is that in some systems, it's the urban system that supports pollinator populations for crops, which is amazing. So it's the pollinators that come out of the city into the surrounding countryside which are keeping those crops pollinated now mm. because of the impact that we've had. So it, it's partially about the benefits for the people living in those areas, but also for the wider environment as well. I think there's more we could do, for example, in getting biodiversity into green space. So green space mm. work is often just about green space, but it mm. could be about biodiversity as well. Mm. Um, and we're learning more about the health benefits of, of, of having green space and, and having biodiversity in our cities. And if we look at cultural ecosystem services, uh, we know now that those are delivered by the interaction of people in their environment, and they're so important around big urban areas. Um, so it, it's critical that we start making this link. Uh, and then that, that may ultimately lead to sort of wider support for biodiversity conservation throughout the Scottish environment. It's those, I, I, mean, I completely agree. Go and talk to kids, mm -hmm. enthuse them. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and can I just maybe follow up uh, with Rob? Um, would you be in favour then of some of the finance being pushed down to that lower level? Uh, I know it's very limited at the moment and people might want that, but would that be a good thing to, for government to consider? Oh, it's not really my, my area <laughs> of expertise. I mean, pers personally, just as a personal opinion, yeah, I mean, I think it'd be great if you were supporting things which gave a chance for kids to connect to their environment and, and care about it. Gardening's a great way of doing it. Mm. I'm going into a school. It's science week this week, so I'm going into a primary school on Friday to talk to them about... Um, how you, how you measure ecology and the environment and just try and get some enthusiasm. It, it's all around them, but some yeah. of them just don't see it. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope that attitude to certain of the chemicals that people used in 1950 in their gardens nowadays. <laughs> uh, but that's just <laughs> I, another I saw point. Derek nodding his head. Do, do you agree with De that? Derek, Derek is, is just going to speak convenient. anyway, yes. <laughs> You know, yeah, I'd like to back up your point there, Dave. I think it's fundamental. I can't say what's happened since 2010, but almost certainly over the last two generations, you know, the urban community and their children have, lost, have kind of lost touch with the environment. And what we're finding in the borders is even our, our, our small towns in these, in these schools, they are now beginning to lose touch with the countryside. So even the, the country kids are, are losing touch with the countryside. So we've really got to 
start investing in our children and our children's education of how the land functions and how uh, wildlife is involved in that and land use is involved in that. So there's a huge educational role needed. So I would echo your point and welcome funding down that road very much. I, that, I mean, I, I often come to things and, and people talk about the disconnect between um, young people and, and the environment. Um, and it often sometimes feels a bit of doom and gloom, but there's also you know, an awful lot of young folk out there who are incredibly connected to the environment. And there's also an awful lot of good work being done across a huge amount of organisations. I mean, you know, just in terms of the Cairn Gorms, we obviously we, we run through the, the John Muir Award. Now, next this coming year, we'll put through our 25,000th um, child through that, which is a quarter of all the awards in Scotland, just as an example. I mean, I know Forestry Commission have got their schools. Every school in um, the National Park gets visited and has educational things. We do lots of work with outreach side of things. I actually think there's a huge amount going on. Now, is it as well coordinated as it should be? There's possibly work to be done there to make sure that we actually get that spread across all of Scotland. And our urban area is absolutely important, absolutely, in terms of that. But I, I do think we sometimes... It's that classic thing of saying, yes, children are disconnected and we need to do something about that. Actually, I think an awful lot of folk are incredibly connected and have an awful lot of um, uh, opinions about climate change and things that would um, probably put a lot of us to shame. So, I mean, I, I suspect there's probably more out there in terms of people's understanding of biodiversity at, at a school level than we actually sometimes um, like to say. Yes, Sue Myers. Yeah. Come in and say one um, thing about... One thing that we find very challenging is actually being able to assess the quality of green space within our cities and towns. It's very important that we have um, green space and we've got some really good maps of the extent of the green space area, but the actual quality of that for biodiversity, that's quite a tricky nut to crack and we'd love to be able to have more information on that. And if we can get people to produce gardens of flowers rather than gravel and um, you know, proper grass instead of manicured lawns, um, I'm in danger of becoming a hobby horse here. But, you know, to get people to accept that nature is messy and because that is the first contact that people have with nature as children. It's where we get most of our contact in our daily lives. So I think the urban green space environment is a critical thing for um, us to think about. Before I bring in Mike, uh, Simon uh, Jones. And then yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I've got a couple of points to make. And Fina, just to go back to, I suppose, the, the quality of urban green space. And I, I, I think this is why the need to roll out ecosystem health indicators, which at an urban level are really challenging, but we need to crack on with this. They've, you know, they've, been, they've kind of been floating around for a couple of years now. We, we need a unit so we can understand let's say the catchment scale at whether it be a city so we know what we're measuring so we know what change we want to make and i think the ecosystem health gain is that just back to the education point and i'm very mindful that uh, that i'm mike russell in terms of uh, some of our previous experience together with beavers in, in education i've got two young daughters one at primary school and one at high school and i'd agree with grant i don't need to worry about them in terms of their enthusiasm and their kind of general understanding of of their impact on, on the planet, but I'm constantly frustrated by the education, education system that locks them inside and doesn't get them out enough to get hands on and get, and get dirty and make it a real connection. Like it or not, more of us now live in cities than in the urban area. So even if it be allotments, we have to face the fact that it's going to become harder and harder for children to be really practically engaged with land management if it's not sufficiently built in to every day they get outside and they learn something outside, ideally we're getting their hands, hands dirty. I don't see the problem with my children, I see the problem with their teachers who do want to get outside and get wet and dirty. That's a very personal experience though. Was yours a supplementary or is it a separate question? Well, I was going to follow this up. I mean, right, okay, and then back to Dave, yeah. Sure. I suppose I'd be very struck by what Dave said. I suppose if I were to, if I would have regression therapy, I would get to the stage, I remember watching sycamore trees outside the house that I lived in being cut down uh, when I was a very young child because the council had decreed they should go because they were uh, unsafe for traffic management. And I suppose that inculcated in me a particular love of trees, which I've never got over, uh, which happily I became forestry minister at one stage to allow me to do it. But the point you make about contact, children's contact with the environment and with biodiversity is a very important one. The picture is not gloomy, really. A forest, I mean, I've been to a forest school in, in Townhead Primary in Glasgow, in the centre of Glasgow, 
where the forest school activity was undertaken in Town Hyde Park, and it was wonderful. We have a higher proportion of eco-schools in Scotland than almost any other country in, in Europe. And biodiversity is part of that. You know, the, the, the experience is varied, but biodiversity is part of that. The question is, is it becoming a mainstream part of our education or not? And if it's not becoming a mainstream part of our education, how should we make it that? There are outdoor nurseries, for example, which the whole work of the nurseries outdoor. And I, for a while, was, was, was supporting and continue to support outdoor primaries, where primary one and two is also delivered out of doors. But I think for this committee, the issue is, is there a structure that is in place that allows the environmental experience to be mainstreamed, and does bi biodiversity get into that? We might want to consider that when we look at the government's biodiversity plan to make sure that education and the involvement of children is part of it. Thanks for that. And Dave uh, Thompson, to kind of sum up? Or... Yes, thank, thank you, convener. And I would very much support what uh, Mike Russell has just said. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, in the urban uh, situation, I suppose, is that uh, we have created a situation in this country uh, where a home is a an asset that you gamble with, that you invest in, and rather than a home being a home. Therefore, that has pushed up uh, land values. And, of course, there's other re reasons as well that we get that through planning and through people land banking and people holding on to big bits of ground. I mean, there's no shortage of land in the highlands, but land values are massive. Therefore, you get a situation where a builder will get a plot of land, he'll put, sho shove 20 houses into it, and with a garden the size of a postage stamp. So even if the people wanted to actually grow their own, they can't, because the cost of that land in relation to the cost of housing, pushed up by the sort of way that our society has developed over the last 20, 30 years, where, as I say, a house is an investment, it's not a, not a home, it doesn't actually help. Now, there are obviously ways that that could be dealt with, but probably not within the remit of the committee here to delve into all of that. But that also makes it more difficult because these days you're not going to get a house like the house that I was born in with uh, 60 by 180 feet bit of ground to allow you to do your own, and unless you buy a croft or whatever. And, of course, the planning system stops farmers in places like Glen Urquhart and others giving a bit of land to a youngster uh, to uh, build a house because they want all the houses clumped together down in Drumna Drocket. So there's lots of things here that militate against um, better use of land from an environmental and a biodiversity point of view. Yes, talking about these things continually in the Community Empowerment Bill uh, and also in the land reform consultation and bill that's coming forward. So they are, and they are a part of, very much a part of this. And uh, Talking about uh, land at great prices owned by a few people, we'll move on to invasive non-native species. <laughs> this and the issue of disease, because I think they are, uh, whilst they are a bit of the gloomy story that uh, you were talking about, uh, uh, they are important issues. In terms of non-native species, I'm aware, for example, the work that Tweed has been done on the Tweed, um, there is considerable work that requires to be done uh, in Loch Ken still with and, and its surrounding waters. And many of us who have struggled with that issue for some years believe the time has come for fairly dramatic action. I'd want people on the panel to address, if they could, two issues. One is, is this still a priority, or is it something we simply have to be more relaxed about because they are here to stay and there's not much we can do about them? Um, and some of the definitions are, can be curious. But secondly, on the issue of disease, how we can also cope with uh, climate change and the importation of disease. And I think for, in forestry terms, probably there's more experience of that now than there is elsewhere. And what might lie ahead? I'd be interested in views from the panel. Chris Nixon, do you start off? Yeah, um, well, just on, on the invasive species, I, I mentioned our, our work on, on rhododendron as one example, and I think that that's a that's a good example of that of that of that type. In that there's a huge area we've now identified almost thirty thousand hectares of uh, rhododendron um, dominated woodland on the, on the National Forest Estate. So that's obviously having a huge impact on biodiversity in, in its way, and, the, and particularly condition of native woodlands. 
Um, we have a large program of treatment, and we've, we've um, treated now uh, almost a third, just over a third of that, about just over 10,000 hectares. So the, it's a large program, uh, a lot of efforts going into it, and it's just the sheer scale of it which I think indicates the seriousness of the issue that, that if, if we were to you know, uh, retract from it, then, then there would be a, a serious implications for, for the biodiversity and, and the status of our not just designated sites, but, but a lot, uh, you know, in general, biodiversity in general. So uh, it's, a, it's a very serious issue and, and one that we need to maintain a, a very strong focus on. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, forest health or, or tree health, it, in a way, I think one of the key, key things there is um, being able to uh, monitor and react to um, emerging, emerging threats, uh, new and emerging threats. And I think that, that's an area where a, a focus is required, both in terms of um, work at ports and in, and in terms of uh, import controls and ensuring that there's effective hygiene, uh, but also in the forest and maintaining um, a vigilance uh, and an ability to assess and and act when when new or emerging threats uh, you know uh, come about scale mapping uh, and surveying activities i'm thinking of an edinburgh company new edinburgh company called intelligent solutions that's doing it by satellite seem to provide some solutions for at least monitoring the spread of disease yeah. um, i don't think the commission is yet using those um, is that actively under consideration uh, it, it, it is. Um, uh, it is being pursued, and um, one of the uh, one of the questions there is is access to su sufficient sufficient data, um, and um, the, the resources to put in place the program. For instance, um, for uh, lidar re uh, data, which allows would allow a um, potentially uh, allow. A, forest and other habitat condition to be monitored over time on a broad scale. So, so there's an issue of investment in the, in the program of remote sensing. Although there are, there are satellite passes in in which give publicly available information um, on a weekly or 10 daily basis, uh, which you, could build up, you can build up a very interesting picture of change quite quickly, although the data processing is enormous. But some of that work, uh, pioneering work is being done in Edinburgh, and I think the Commission probably should show an interest in it. I'm well, sure it well we, are, we are showing an interest in, it in, in respect to the National Forest Inventory and, and the way that's taken forward in the future. Good. So I would agree with you that it's certainly an area for, you know, for, for that continuing investigation of the potential of the use of that kind of uh, data. I just wondered about the Tweed experience, because you had some successful experience in what appeared to be a hopeless case. Yes, indeed. Um, Tweed Forum has been working over the last 15 years with landowners and farmers to tackle um, giant hogweed control, and Japanese knotweed control. And 15 years ago, it was rife on the whole river system. And now you'd be hard-pressed to find a decent patch of knotweed or hogweed anywhere. It is there, but it's, it's in very small patches. But... It is important to continue that, having made these gains, to continue it going and keep on top of it. And that, but that does require a, a very much a coordinated approach. And going forward, the only way, realistic way of doing that is, is, is encouraging farmers to, and landers to do it themselves in their own patch of land. But in other areas, to get SRDP funding to put collaborative bids in to tackle it across the wider catchment. So that does require ongoing funding, ongoing maintenance, ongoing coordination, ongoing facilitation. But we do feel it's fundamental. Haven't, haven't made these huge gains because if you if you take the foot off the pedal, it will come back again. Chris Nixon, first of all, okay. It was just very quickly, really, to to agree. I think very strongly, actually, with Derek there that 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 that, that coordinated effort is absolutely crucial, um, where uh, to avoid circumstances where what can be a considerable effort and expense is put into to control uh, some of these invasive species. And then the effort, it effect, if maybe doesn't quite come to nothing, but it's certainly negated by a uh, spread from neighboring land where that, those kind of operations aren't, aren't being undertaken. Uh, we've, just before we come on to Alec Ferguson, we should go to Rob first and then Grant. One 
are invasive non-natives a priority? If you look at the impact they can have in some areas, they really do need to be. Look at mink impacts on waterfall populations in the highlands. But I think it's another great example of how a coordinated approach involving land managers and researchers and the general public can really have a positive benefit. So that's a great example of citizen science. And people have learned so much about ecology from participating in that mink control program. Um, in terms of uh, dealing with diseases and pests coming into the system, I think it emphasizes the need to keep a flexible research base. So what recently I was involved in a piece of work for JNCC where we looked at the potential consequences of ash dieback because we had a team of researchers in place at that time, we could very quickly get a response out in terms of what the likely ecological consequences are. Um, so I think that's, that's important. Another piece of research that's related to disease um, influx is work on integrated pest management. And we're starting to learn the importance again there of maintaining biodiversity in production systems, be it forestry systems or crop systems keeping that diversity in, not just in terms of the kind of crop, but also the genetic diversity of the crop itself, can have really major benefits in terms of controlling disease spread through these systems. And we're, we're starting to understand that a lot better. So um, we do have new knowledge that will help us cope with these diseases that are coming through climate change. But maintaining a flexible research base that can respond quickly and, and help with the monitoring as well, I think, is, is critical. Yep. Here Simon Jones, and then I think another supplementary on this. I'll, I'll be brief on this one, which is, uh, I mean, I think that it's an incredibly important issue, invasive uh, non-native species. The bit that I think is most tricky is the ongoing funding, um, in that how much is that and how do you keep on going? And how do you, you know, if you, if you scale up something like what's happening at the Tweed Forum and then you start looking at all the different non-native species we have to deal with across a huge range of different areas and different things. The bill for, okay, you might be able to get the money to start to do the things, but the bill for ongoing to make sure that it doesn't come back or that it's kept in check um, keeps, on, keeps on going. And it doesn't disappear in the future, it keeps on going. So how do you afford that? And I think that's a pretty tricky one, actually, for the invasive side of things. And, I, and again, I don't think we've quite cracked how we do that, um, and I think we've got to have a good think about that before we, we continue on with some of those. And I think there's, I suppose it's a bit of a triage system, isn't it? There's some things you're going to live with, you're just going to accept in the system. There's some things you want to keep as where they are at the moment, and so you're going to have to invest money to try and keep them, and some things you're going to have to try and eradicate because they've just arrived and there's, there's worthwhile doing that. Um, and I think you've got to be pretty practical about it. Um, I do think there's a huge... One thing that I would say is that of all the things in biodiversity that I think it's actually relatively easy to get communities and volunteers involved in, um, invasive species is actually one that people genuinely want to get rid of in their local communities. And where it's worked well, there's been some really good volunteer programmes to eradicate stuff. But I do think the ongoing funding issue of how you do this in the long term, you can't just keep on putting money into the system into into an advantage or a business for the community. I mean, we, mm -hmm. Alec and I had uh, a great effort on crayfish at one stage, and it could have been a resource for the community, and it was uh, rather difficult to persuade a number of people it should be. On rhododendron, there are some interesting projects where the wood is being used for a variety of purposes, including yeah. for making into a, 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 a biofuel. Now, if that is a possibility, then you get a virtuous yes. circle. I'm not sure what you can do with giant hogweed, but... Presumably, the, the intelligence and inventiveness of man and woman will produce some result at some stage. But it is trying yeah. to do that in some way, because I, I entirely agree. I don't think it is sustainable, in every sense of the word, to go on culling rhododendron in Argyll and Butte. I mean, I yeah. think you could spend your entire life, and it would be the task of Sisyphus. You would not succeed. We've got uh, Simon Jones, and uh, if Sue wanted to come in on that as well. Right. Try and draw this bit. Uh, uh, yes, to, to follow on from Grant, and I saw somebody who oversees Saving Scotland's Red Squirrel project. I'm aware of what a, an ongoing battle that that can be, but how important that is to the people of Scotland, really, and the business of Scotland. But I will I'll kind of go out on a limb here and and say, undoubtedly, certain key invasive species are key threats and again I think that's still best to decide at a catchment level as to where you put your resources in. I still would not prioritise it above things which I think are more important for example uh, national ecological networks. I think if it's, a, if it's a matter of hard decisions about money then I think at local levels invasive non-natives is very important but 
if you think about your overall resource and the restoration of ecosystems on a much bigger scale and more, more connected, there's, you know, in some instances, you can spread a problem in ways of non-natives, but ultimately, if you're increasing habitat and ecosystem health, then you have a greater ability to dilute problems as well if you target, target action. So I'd, I'd maybe slightly differ from, from people, but if you had to make hard decisions, I think there are other things within the, the challenge that probably sit as being more important than invasive non-natives. I'm sure my members will thank me for saying that. <laughs> uh, I was wondering on our comment on reporting progress for tackling invasive non-native species, which we do think are very important um, to maintain and keep under control uh, at SNH. Um, and one of the ecosystem health indicators we're looking at is looking at data on distribution of various species and then being able to chart that over time um, and make that available on the Scottish Environment website um, so you can get a sort of interactive display of the change in numbers and species of invasive non-natives. And what that can possibly help in is where you have this issue where one area focuses their effort on uh, eradicating a species and the guys around the corner don't, you are probably not it's not good spending money because by the very nature the invasive species just come back and so by using this kind of approach hopefully we'll be able to see where the um, areas that we need to target and encourage to get on board and get rid of some of these invasive non-native species hopefully we'll be able to have the tools to do that kind of work and I think another really important thing is that we need to be aware of new species on the horizon and you know what makes an invasive non-native species invasive? Well, we just need to watch out and see um, what's there because, yeah. Just before you... Okay, Alec Ferguson had his hand up for a while. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Convener. I, I, Mike Russell mentioned Loch Ken, and I'm afraid you can't mention Loch Ken without my wishing to say something about it because it's right virtually next door to where I live, never mind right in the middle of my constituency, but we have a particular um, issue there with American signal crayfish. Um, uh, and I was just to follow on from what Simon Jones was saying in terms of national priorities as opposed to local priorities. In Loch Ken, we have an ecosystem that's been totally destroyed. Totally destroyed. There is no ecosystem left. It's been eaten, bored into um, by this invasive species. To which, with the best will in the world, the, the response of the SNH, which is the overarching body that can do something about this, is to if I can simplify it and, and parody the situation slightly, issue leaflets uh, to coarse fishermen who are visiting to ask them to make sure they wash their gear before they go home. That will work because there are less and less coarse fishermen coming all the time, because there's less and less coarse fish to catch, because the ecosystem that sustains them has been destroyed. Um, it, it, it is just an example of... Uh, now, now, that problem is going to get worse and worse and worse, and eventually there will come a day if this is how this is pursued. There will come a day when uh, American signal crayfish can't be called invasive anymore, uh, or indeed alien, because they're going to be in every waterway in Scotland, and they will have, they will become a natural um, species, rather like they are now south of the border, I believe. Um, and I can understand all sorts of reasons for not issuing commercial licenses, but you have a, a community around that lot of communities uh, which, which have a 100% desire to get rid of these things. Um, there could have been some sort of commercialization. Mike Russell, as a minister, very bravely explored some of those possibilities. Um, and one or two of his civil servants even more bravely tried to question some of his decisions, I seem to remember. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, um, which was a, an extremely interesting experience. Um, but but I, I, I simply put that forward, convener, and thank you for allowing me to do so, as an example of, of the, the conflicts and the dilemmas that we have in this whole area of discussion. I think um, there are huge local issues and I accept uh, currently that is not a national priority but I would argue unless you address uh, the local issues and try and nip some of these things in the bud you're going to end up with a national problem uh, uh, Sarah Boyack just in the last two comments really um, about local and national and um, Sue Mars you just mentioned the SNH biodiversity report card um, can you say a little bit more about that in terms of um, how you see it being rolled out, you say it's going to be on the web, is to get a sense of is it national or local and then get some feedback um, from the other participants as to how useful um, they see that potential report card. Um, well, the bit of work I referred to was a set of ecosystem health indicators um, 
which will be rolled out on a national scale um, on the web. The biodiversity report card is a slightly different um, issue, but they're related. In, and what we plan to do with the biodiversity report card is that annually, leading up to 2020, is report on our progress against each of the 20 HE targets to see how well we're getting on. And we're planning to produce that in November each year. And the format we're thinking of delivering that with is a two to four page summary document saying where we're doing well, where we could do better, and that to be backed up with a um, more robust referenced report so that people can see where we're get, getting the information from. It's not going to be based on opinion. It's going to be based on evidence from scientific literature, SNH commissioned research reports, work that's going on around Scotland. Um, and each year we will build up our evidence base and hopefully the report itself will um, allow us to target what action we need to do and will also, by, when we come to reporting for 2020, we'll actually have a very good understanding of what we've been doing to reach these 20 HE targets. And the work's being delivered, oh, the work's being delivered um, with the support from the Science and Technical Group from the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy. Um, ecosystem health indicators? The ecosystem health indicators will be, we will draw on the information that they contain to inform that report. Um, so just that that's of one of the things that's come out today has been really important to not just have the headline biodiversity ambition, but to make it work at an ecosystem level so that people can see how they relate. Yeah. yeah. This bit yeah. just now because Chris Dixon wants to say something, then James. Chris Nixon. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it was just a, a sort of comment that uh, I guess one thing that we're all wrestling with to some extent is is the terminology around um, the, the sort of concepts of natural capital and ecosystem services. I, I think, and, and 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 how you know biodiversity per se fits into that kind of broader consideration. And I think in terms of reporting and reporting in the future on on um, uh, uh, achievements or, or the, the, the condition of the environment, then I think there's a task for us all really to, to try and uh, work on those concepts and, 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 and try to sort of um, inject some clarity about the way, it's, the way those things are reported because you, you see very, very often um, different interpretations of natural capital, uh, and ecosystem services, and I think uh, there's, there's a, a sort of a job to do to create a, uh, a common, recognised language around those things that, that, that will lead to m more clarity in reporting. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's great to hear the development of sort of these indicators for ecosystem health and, and further development of the biodiversity indicators. I just kind of want to reflect on the experience of the Aberdeenshire pilot in terms of, you know, we had to kind of build up a picture of the state of our area and we had to do that kind of very rapidly admittedly with extensive help from the James Hutton Institute but, but we kind of had to muddle through in a sense there wasn't anything kind of um, readily available that we could grab onto and say within Aberdeenshire you know ecosystems are in this state biodiversity is in this state there's a number of national measures and, and I realize we're, we're a bit away from having that kind of information available but it, it's really a plea for for that information to be made available and to be made disaggregatable into regional or catchments or whatever scale we, we want to do this at because you know how are we meant to kind of assess what are the priorities what are the key issues where should we, we be t targeting effort and measures without that information being available if that had been available both Derek and my jobs would have been quite a bit easier I have to say so um, it's a plea really for that other points on what uh, Sarah was asked yes Rob so I think it comes back to the um, question of terminology about ecosystem services and natural capital I think there's been a lot of thinking um, about that over the last few years and there's some very good documents out there in terms of trying to set out all the different uses of the terminology and, and perhaps the most useful uses of the terminology but it comes back down to this issue of making sure that the right information gets to the right people and to have some kind of forum where we're all working together using the same um, the same terminology that make life so much easier um, and having clarified I think in many cases what we mean by these terms now we're in a position to start developing indicators 
which are relevant to them. So cultural services, I think, for many of us three or four years back, were a bit of a mystery, but they're such a key part of what people get from their environment. Now we have a much better idea of how we might be able to measure them, and from that we can start developing indicators. And it comes back to the ecosystem health indicators. One of the key um, criteria for including new data sets in that is the fact that they can be downscaled to a catchment level. So we're always thinking about how we can get this targeted work in there. So again, we're in a good place. We just need to make sure the information moves around to the right people. Grant Hoyer. Yeah, um, very quick point, which is, I mean, I, I, um, I agree that indicators, data, uh, monitoring, language is all important. Um, I do worry sometimes that that's what we end up concentrating on um, and that we, that there is a lot of data out there. Um, if you ask most people what the main issues are in their area, they'll be able to tell you pretty quickly. If I was to say what are the main issues in the Cairn Gardens, I could listen off in two seconds flat. I'm sure everyone can do that for their areas as well. Um, we need to get on with the action. And yes, we need to measure the implementation. And yes, we need to have the right indicators. But um, we do tend to have an industry around that. And um, I am interested in getting practical action on the ground. So I think that's where um, I want to make sure that by 2020, we're meeting those targets. Um, yes, that we measure everything, but not that we measure everything and then go, have we done anything yet? And we're at 2020. So um, I suppose that's my way around of looking at it. So, uh, Hey, Sue, please. And, um, um, Rob's observation about our scalability, the very fact that for the ecosystem health indicators, um, we are looking to scale from the national down to the local means that we've actually got a very limited number of data sets to play with, which is unfortunate. And I entirely support what Grant said, is that we shouldn't um, have the ambition for this kind of data set stopping us taking action on the ground. Um, I think we should be coming to a bit of that. Yes, yeah. Simon uh, Jones, just quick points. Uh, I, in in relation to data, and I, and I, there is a lot out there. It's complex. Uh, importantly, we're now, you know, we're realising that effectively what might have been one point was put aside as biodiversity data actually is economically and socially important. So there's this kind of cross referencing that's really important, particularly when you're at a local level and you're trying to pick it apart. But you know, a, a reduction in ecosystem health is actually, we know now, having an economic uh, consequence. In terms of action, it's, it's interesting that just last week I found out that the French government are tabling a new, a new biodiversity law where they're going to be introducing priority zones to protect areas where species are at risk and ecological corridors at a, at a national, uh, national extent and in their international territories as well, uh, which is apparently due to the, the formation of a new, new agency. Frankly, I think it's that kind of action and that kind of statement to, to pick up on Grant, Grant's point. Having been involved in red squirrels for a long time, it's every 10 years we count how many red squirrels are left. Uh, and I, I think the, 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 the fundamental legislation incentives that, that drive this forward, they're still some of the big elephants in the room, really. So, um. OK, uh, I think I'm going to try and uh, move us into a couple of uh, areas of actually tackling these things but the first one's about the human level um you know would what do you think about the fact that uh, you know there are obvious benefits for improved health and quality of life to have a healthier environment but do you think that such benefits are seen across society as a whole or is it limited in particular social groups uh, is that something which is being measured uh, is it something you're aware of? Because uh, clearly, if you live in an area with a national park, you start off with people who are much more familiar with the countryside. If you're dealing with the vast majority of kids, they're in an urban environment, and uh, there's all the different uh, aspects about how much they become involved with the environment. But you know, do you think that social class and social groups uh, are pretty mixed in their uptake of the benefits? of uh, having a healthier environment. Grant. Um, 
I mean, I think it's, it's a key question. And uh, there was a conference last year, a John Muir conference in, in Perth, which the parks organised with a load of people. And Jason Leach spoke um, from the NHS side of things and basically said, um, we put up a picture of a family um, in Perth. Um, and I remember the whole story around this family. And he said, well, you know, what are you doing for that person? And how do they get out of, out of that house in Perth and, and enjoy the country, whether that be close to them or whether that be in national parks? And I think that is a big challenge for all of us. I mean, I know that there's a lot of work going on and in terms of we try to reach out to Inverness, Aberdeen, Dundee, Perth, around the park, in terms of that's where we're focusing. It's not necessarily on the people within the park in terms of the education side. We still do a lot within the park as well, but in terms of that's where we're looking. But we tend to use other organisations who are more engaged in that area. So things like uh, we do a lot of work with Backbone, uh, which is an organisation which um, trains community leaders in those places to then get people to come out of their own accord, if you like, rather than needing, uh, if you like, rangers or guides or anything like that, that they, they have the confidence to come out into places like, like the Cairngorms. But um, it's a big issue um, in terms of do we still preach too much to the converted? Probably. Um, do we need to um, get the message out wider? Absolutely. What are the mechanisms to do that? Um, I think we've got some. I think we could probably do that better if we'd started to coordinate slightly across not just the public agencies, but into the NGOs, etc., about how we're all doing that and then seeing who's targeting who. Are we all actually targeting the same lot and actually we're not, nobody's targeting across here? So I think there's probably more work to be done on that. But I actually think there's a lot of decent stuff going on um, across lots of different organisations. But it's a big, I think it's a big issue, actually. And um, we probably still do um, uh, conservation or biodiversity, probably still sitting here with a, being a white-bearded man. Um, it, it's probably white-bearded men um, who uh, conservation, that's what people got in their head. We need to get away from that. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I'm just, you know, I'm not saying anything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> During your bearded men, yeah. I completely agree that uh, there's uh, something in what you say. Uh, I'm not, not going to prolong this one. I think that's almost summed it up. But Angus uh, MacDonald's the next question about this outcome. Hey, convener, um, in the 2020 challenge, uh, we're all aware that uh, the strategic outcome number four uh, states that the, speci this, the special value and international importance of Scotland's nature and geodiversity is assured, wildlife is faring well, and we have a highly effective network of protected places. Now, if you'll um, forgive me to, uh, for being slightly parochial, convener, for a second, uh, I just happened to have the biodiversity duty report from a uh, Falkirk Council, which was recently submitted to uh, the Scottish Government, um, and it actually highlights uh, a prime example of partnership working uh, with the Inner Force Landscape Initiative, uh, which is delivering uh, a number of projects, 30 odd projects, I think, uh, around the Inner Force uh, over the period 2014 to, to 2019. Uh, and I think it was actually launched in this very committee room by the, the previous Environment Minister, which I was pleased to host. Now, um, can I ask the panel members if you're aware of any other initiatives that are taking place to improve plant, habitat and species diversity in Scotland? Uh, and are these initiatives underpinned by the highly effective network of protected places, uh, as stated in um, outcome number four? And I'm thinking... Um, for example, of uh, deer management practices or initiatives, uh, and any other examples would certainly be welcome. Okay, just a couple of people down on the bottom here have mentioned the subject. Uh, Grant, first of all, then. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some very good examples, and there, there's lots of. Um, I mean, all across Scotland, there's there's lots of examples. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one that, which is a slightly um, is um, which is. Is on the socio-economic side as well as the the environment side, and I think it shows how it brings it together. But the Glenlivet Tomtool Landscape Partnership, um, which is being led by a local community there, which covers off a huge range of different things from the cultural heritage through to access side of things, through to um, riparian woodlands, etc. It's, it's across a whole range of things. Um, there are lots of good examples where protected areas come into that as well um, and I think probably from my point of view the bit about the protected areas I mean 50% of the Cairngorms is Natura um, and the large proportion of that is Triple SI and there's National Nature Reserves and there's that, 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 that all the designations are there. Um, I think it's about trying to make those work as a collective within bigger landscapes is the, is the big 
um, gain for us over the next little while. So instead of looking at them as, if you like, individual protected areas, it's actually saying how does that work as a collective? So within, for instance, Strathspey, there are um, seven or eight individual SPAs for Kappa Cayley. Well, that's a meta population. That's a thing that we should be looking at collectively. So the Cairngorm National Park Authority has put together the Kappa framework, which is looking across that whole woodland about how that works across recreation, development, uh, conservation, habitat, expansion, etc. So I think there's lots of good examples of where we are doing that. And I think protected areas um, provide a very good base to that. Um, but there's a case for saying how do they work better as a network and how do the bits in between them work as well because we can't just have islands um, that, you know, th that they're helpful to that degree but we need to join them all up as to how that works as a network and I suppose it gets back to the point that I made about the National e Ecological Network. They would be part of that and a very key part of that but there's all, obviously all the links between that that we still need to have a good think about where we put that extra effort in between. Uh, Simon Jones. Uh, Yes, and to, fo to follow up, and, 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 I, and I think the, the National Ecological Network is, is the, the next big step, obviously. If you take a snapshot at looking, looking at just protected areas, you only get one part of the, the picture. And if you look at the, the latest uh, State of the Environment report from the European Environment Agency, it's clear that the long-term trends are still very threatening, even if we've made some good progress in some particular habitats with some, some species. It's the bits outside the protected areas, uh, the bits that are going to really get us there when it comes to things like the 2020 challenge. I think good things, I think Scottish Government should be commended for the, the marine protected area designation. I think that's been a great step forward in habitats and species. Um, the trick is how well that's going to really work in practice in the, in the management, and I think we've got real, real worries about, about that. But the more we look, the more we find. In a marine perspective, you may be aware that um, Scottish Natural Heritage and the Wildlife Trust got together last year to work with local scallop fishermen to investigate merl beds up in the west of Ross and MPA. And nobody knew it was there because you didn't until you looked and nobody knew it was there. And then you, then you protect that. And it makes you think, well, from a, from a marine perspective, a marine take, the onus is on <coughs> us to identify the feature for protection before it can be protected and taken account of, rather than looking at it from a different perspective as to, to any industry, what is my impact going to be on this ecosystem by, by me taking from it? So we, we have to find that rather than, like, for example, certain elements of the fishing community not having to do that. So I, I, I think uh, Scotland generally has made some really good progress in this area. We understand more, certainly about our protected areas. We need to think outside the box and we need to grapple some of these big issues like large scale ecological networks as it appears as if maybe the French are just about to, to do. Uh, Derek and Chris uh, want some points, first of all. Yep. Any links to that? I'd just like to back up Grant's point there, yes. coming back to designated sites and how you integrate them with the, maybe the non-designated landscapes. We were working on a project in Edelston Water. We were trying to slow down the floodwaters coming into the valley so they don't flood people so badly. And at the head of the catchment there, there will be designated peatland sites. Um, you can block the hill drains in these designated sites. That's part of the designated site management. And other parts of the catch, we can fence off native woodlands and plant native woodlands. And further down in the floodplain, we can re-meander the river that were formerly canalised. So it's bringing these designated management sites into, into line with the non-designated sites in the valley. So you can bring this whole catchment approach together and to work at the catchment scale. So that's one good example, I think, of, of bringing these uh, habitats together. Chris Dixon. Yeah, just a, a comment, I guess, uh, along similar lines to others here, really. We, uh, in, uh, in terms of woodland, woodland um, protected areas on the, on the National Forest State, we're, we're now fortunate in that many of them, in fact, uh, over 90% of them are in favourable uh, favorable condition. A lot of work has gone, gone into improving, uh, improving and focusing on, on those areas and in, in improving the condition of the habitats, which is, which is, which is, which is great. How, however, there is a broader, as, as Simon and others have said, there is a, there's a broader question about connectivity, other non-protected sites, and, that, and that's really where the focus uh, needs to be um, as much as in the protected areas and ensuring uh, that the condition of, of, of the broader landscape is, is improved. And, and certainly the, in, in woodland terms, the Native Woodland Survey of Scotland showed that around 50% of the broader 
semi-natural woodlands were, were in, in need of um, work to improve the conditions. So there's, there's quite a significant task there at a landscape scale to, to build on the, the, the benefits that have accrued from having protected areas to, to broaden, broaden that and see you know, wider scale improvements in, in condition. Dave, did you have a supplementary on this point, was it? Thanks very much, uh, convener. It was really to pick up on the point that uh, Simon raised there about metal beds. An interesting thing that he said, if you think about it, uh, the found metal beds that nobody knew were there. Now, these things don't spring up overnight. They're developed over a very long period of time. So the fact that they were there, despite the fact that fishermen have been fishing that ground for hundreds of years, I think is very interesting because the metal beds obviously have developed and survived despite you know, uh, other use. And I think we need to be really careful when we're looking at MPAs that we don't say, ah, a metal bed, better protect that from the fishermen, whether it's creels or, or other methods, and forgetting that it's been protected, obviously, or it wouldn't be there over many, many years, and we need to allow for, uh, for that and, and, and to get a sensible um, agreement that there can continue to be economic activity, um, maybe directed in a, in a different way, rather than what has happened sometimes in the past and what a lot of people on the West Coast fear, and that is just a blanket exclusion as soon as something uh, is found and that's what we must avoid at all costs and I'm involved at the moment in discussions uh, about the different uh, MPAs, there's an interesting one around uh, the small isles uh, and I think there's a way that we can you know, allow continued uh, fishing from different methods as well, as well as protecting the environment. So it was just a comment on that, that point that this, the metal beds have just been discovered and must have sprung up overnight. Obviously, they didn't. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a very quick point. I, what you've said really comes back to the issue of monitoring. Um, and a lot of the trends that we've talked about <coughs> come from the few good data sets that we have. We have great data sets for certain groups of organisms. Birds are brilliant because people like monitoring birds. Vascular plants are pretty good as well. Some things like deer as well, we monitor well. <laughs> In many cases, for many of the groups of organisms which are important in Scotland, for example, lower plants, we just don't have the monitoring data to detect trends. Um, and, and so we're, we're struggling in some cases just to know what our natural capital is. So some areas are highlighted as being important for a particular species, but to some extent we don't know what the full extent of that species is within Scotland. You know, there was a calemblin that was found on top of Cairngorms, and it was the only record in Scotland. Now, is that the only place where it lives, or is that the only place where a calemblin expert's gone on holiday? So that's that's a key issue, and I think this this monitoring, uh, yeah, <laughs> this this monitoring issue of, of um, for many of the groups that are important, lower plants in particular, things like the rusty bog moss. That's that's an area where we um, where we're really lacking the effort and the and the standardised knowledge across the country. <laughs> Um, uh, Alec Ferguson wanted to point this. I had a very brief point to what the one Dave Thompson made, which I've got great sympathy with, um, <coughs> which is that not only, I think, do we need to look very carefully at just sort of introducing a, a total exclusion zone in some of these areas, but I think there is a potential for knock-on impact of a negative type into other areas that are not covered by these uh, protective measures. Um, and I'm thinking of specifically in my own constituency of Wigton Bay, which is a special protected area, I think, but not, a, not designated as a marine protected area, where the um, area within it that is, going to, is, is currently open to uh, dredging is actually going to be widened considerably, and one can only... Um, there are mill beds in Wigton Bay as well, but one can only put that down to increasing pressure uh, on to, to have fishable areas um, in, in place of where there are, are going to, now going to be sort of total exclusion zones. So I think we just need to be a little bit careful and keep an eye on the knock-on impact of some of these measures that are being taken, which might well have a detrimental impact on the biodiversity of those areas. Okay. Uh, I think we'll move on to a supplementary from uh, Graham Day. Thank you, Kibino. In terms of protecting designated sites and improving biodiversity generally, and with regard to the impact of deer, are we seeing any improvement in practices? What is the current direction of travel, um, given the clock is ticking as far as potentially being more prescriptive with managerial management measures is concerned? 
Grant Moy. Well, I suppose deer are, um, uh, are an interesting issue in the Cairngorms. Um, obviously, got um, some some very uh, large estates that um, where deer is a, is a major issue in terms of the, the economics of the area. Um, there is definitely um, people are coming together, and we're working with them on new new deer management plans uh, in the Cairngorms to try and bring. I know there's work the SNH are doing in Mona Lea, for instance, as well. Um, so there's work underway on that side. I suppose it's. Has that led to any changes on the ground yet? I suppose that we're, I'm, I'm unsure of that actually, to tell you the truth. And I think that's where we're, I, I couldn't say yes, there has definitely been changes for the, for the better or, or that it's still where we are. I think there's still an awful lot of discussion um, as there continues to be around boundaries between different types of management. And I think that's our main issue in the Cairngorms is where you have varying, va varying management objectives. Um, which can sometimes be diametrically opposed, and they, they meet at the boundary between two estates. How you ever reconcile some of those things in a voluntary way, um, I think is quite quite tricky for, for everyone involved. So, I mean, we are deeply involved in the deer management side of things within the Cairngorms, and there's a lot of work and a lot of goodwill to try and make it work. Um, I couldn't say at the moment whether it is leading to the right changes, if you like, for biodiversity or for a whole range of other things, but it's certainly something we're keeping a very close eye on in the Cairngorms. Simon Jones. Thank you, Karina. Um, I, I think I'd agree with, with Grant in terms of I sense a kind of a, a super tanker slowly starting to turn a little bit on, on this one. Uh, the Trust's uh, a member of the Social you know, Deer Management Groups who had their AGM uh, recently, and a, a, one of my team was at that and said he, he sensed the kind of conversations that were happening there were markedly different from a few years ago and there's less polarization and I think the, uh, the, the, the sort of voluntary deer management plan approach with a threat of a mandatory one is, is focusing people's minds. So I, I see it as, at the start where the kind of the relationship, the respect building and the, the concept that actually upland ground and, and deer is not just looked at from an economical an economic uh, input but there is a realization of the other benefits that come that potentially could come from larger scale deer management but i think it's such early days yet that i don't think that i'm not aware of any real evidence on the ground where i can say there's a yeah. other than exclusion or a several estates that have been really heavily culling deer and therefore can show you vegetation changes, radical vegetation changes. Uh, I think we are a long, long way yet from people voluntarily having the will to really do something about large numbers of deer, certainly in, in the uplands. Next, and then James. Uh, yeah, clearly uh, deer management, very big issue on the National Forest Estate, and, and um, I know my colleagues who operate uh, and, and manage that, that side of the house um, aim uh, very much to to demonstrate best practice and, and be seen as you know sort of exemplars of that and, and work I work very hard with the deer management group within the deer management group structure to to try and influence others to you know to adopt best practice as it were um, but inevitably you have to agree with with others that you know it, 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 we still I guess in some respects feel as if we're at a at an early stage in uh, in the sense of influencing um, uh, others uh, across the board to to be undertaking the kind of management that maybe we, we would like to see in order to improve the condition of many habitats. James, not coming from any particular position of expertise in this matter, but I would only observe that um, that the the Aberdeenshire pilot was approached as a vehicle to give more of a focus on lowland deer management within our area, principally roe deer. I mean, we've talked a lot about upland management of deer and presumably that's mainly red deer, but, but I, I, the feeling I got was that there was a gap in the structure and in the, in the targeting in terms of lowland deer management within our area and they were casting around looking for something to hang it on. It wasn't something we were able to pick up, but there may be an issue out there. Um, as I say, not an expert in this matter, but, but it was something that was highlighted to us. Boyat? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to ask the point. We're talking about 2016 uh, point where these management plans for deer management groups have got to be in place and working. 
We're talking also about a 2020 target for biodiversity. Do you think it's possible that we're actually going to get deer in hand by 2020? There must be a heck of a lot of work for gamekeepers, I have to say, because there's a massive amount of extra deer that don't need to be there to get the ecosystem back in balance. Do you think that uh, with the, the deer management plan approach, you know, taking a tough line by 2016 if need be, that it will be time enough to actually show a difference by 2020? A small difference. If there's, man if there's mandatory requirement for deer management plans and there's mandatory requirement for action on the ground, then I think you'll be, by 2020, you will begin in certain places to be able to show some positive impact. But this is a, a this is obviously, a, there's a long time scale in this and, and clearly it's conflated with the issue of particularly sheep numbers on the hill as well and how, how the trend in that can influences what deer, deer are doing as well. But the Wildlife Trust would support a, a mandatory requirement to do that longer term. If we, are re if we are really serious about driving change here, then we need to be prepared to do that. I, th I think it depends on, it would be interesting to see when the, the plans come forward by 2016 in these groups as to what they say, and do we think that that will lead to the changes even beyond the 2020 thing that will actually lead to those changes. And I, I think it's a little bit difficult to say right now um, will, because it hasn't even been agreed what people are really proposing to do, and thus to say will that then help us in 2020, I, I, I don't think we can say that right now. What I would say is that um, unless there are some fairly tight targeting of work within those deer management plans, and I agree there's a, a question of capacity is, 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 a, is a very good one in certain places. I think there will be an issue of can you actually do that within that time frame? But I suppose if you at least knew that that was the game plan and that it would take to 2022 or 2023, then okay, I think you're in, I think you're in, the, you're in the game. Um, but I, I do think that it's a really crucial that when that 2016 thing comes that there's a good look at all those deer management plans and say, well, does that add up to delivering these sorts of targets, because if it doesn't, then, then you're going to have to have another conversation. Um, but I think that's a case of going through all those deer management plans, looking at all the different things that people are proposing to do. And I suspect on certain estates and certain places, they will make that. And in certain areas, they might, might make that. And in other places, they, they might be quite far away. And I think it'll be quite a mixed picture across the whole of Scotland, because the, as, as you know, there are some very good deer management groups, and there's also some places where there aren't even deer management groups that exist. So I think um, it's going to be a pretty mixed picture in 2016 in terms of what is working and what's not. But I think it's crucial that it, a decision is made at that point as to how we definitely take that forward and to say, OK, to meet those 2020 targets, this is really what is going to have to happen. Um, and I think there will be quite a lot of um, uh, differing opinions on that would be... The, the, the signals from here are, I don't see too much demur, that there has to be action on this. And we know what the problem is now, exemplified by the Forestry Commission doing about 30% of the culling and only about 9% of the land. There's a whole lot of people not doing their bit for biodiversity just now. So they don't need to wait <laughs> to 2016 to get started. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was uh, on a... Uh, as we climbed the other day and went through an estate, I won't say which one, but um, where there was, you know, a large amount of feeding of wild deer going on. Now, in, in my, you know, is that what we're looking for come 2020? Simon? Yeah. And just to add to that, convener, again, I'd go back to one of my first points about having a clear vision and being mindful of rural communities who part of their cultural heritage is is deer management and how, you know, how that's, that, that, that's critical. I think we want a vision where the hunting of deer is still very much critical to the, the cultural heritage and the, the economy of these communities in the future. What we want to see it is happening in a slightly different landscape. There was probably more woodland and woodland edge stalking, similar to Scandinavia, where, you know, I don't want to come out and say, you know, want to take on the deer management world. What I want to do is take on the deer management world, how we currently do it. And we think we can still be doing this with biodiversity benefits and people still earning a living from this, but on a, on in a different type of landscape that isn't a bald hillside, which is what currently we've, we've managed to create. 
I think that's been a useful addition to the biodiversity discussion just now, thanks. Uh, uh, but we need to move on to money again. So, uh, Jim Hume. Yeah, thanks very much. Outcome five is regarding sustainable land and, and water management. And two years ago, uh, the minister uh, wrote to this committee saying that the, the common agricultural policy would uh, help drive the changes in land management and and there was a commitment in the draft strategy that that cap uh, reform would do that. We now know what that cap reform is. We've mentioned it uh, slightly earlier. And I just wonder if uh, guests here today would uh, uh, put their view is on cap pillars one and two, and if that they think that is fit for purpose in encouraging land managers to develop and retain uh, biodiversity. Right, who wants to kick off there? No, that's fine then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Move along. It is, sorry, yes, it is, it, is a, it is a thorny issue. Um, in a way, the cap, the cap kind of does, in a way, dictate how the countryside looks. In a way, because it's because it's the subsidised system, because it's it's farmed, it's managed, it's it's been like that for you know for cut for six to fifty odd years or so. Um, that 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 is that is an issue, and it's slowly been evolving and developing and moving forward through in this iteration through greening. It it has been a slight missed opportunity. The conservation bodies would, would agree it's been a missed opportunity, as regards taking a leap forward in conservation. It's taken a small step forward. It's a small step, but it's not a leap, and it's not that step change that we need. I think a lot of people would recognise that, especially for the environmental NGOs. Um, we don't have the answer to that, necessarily, but um, it's probably not going to go as far as, as, as the conservation bodies would like to have seen it go. Okay. So, Rob, and then James. The, um, I'm not an expert on CAP, but we've been doing a bit of work over the last couple of weeks, just by chance, looking at the biodiversity benefits of greening in Pillar 1. And what we've seen from that work supports what Derek has said, is that there may be some benefits. Um, it's going to be entirely dependent in some cases on, for example, if you're changing the crop that you're growing or going over to two or three crops, exactly what different crops you go to. So part of it is about the guidance that's put in place. If the guidance is focused on supporting biodiversity, some of those actions that are there as, as possibilities may be beneficial, whereas some of the other things that you could do for example, switching from spring to winter barley possibly is not going to have such a big consequence. So there may be some benefits to biodiversity. Those benefits will be dependent on the choices that are made in terms of land management, and that's going to be in part dependent on helpful guidance going out to people, I think. James? Um, I mean, I'm going to give you a deep analysis of CAP because I'm, I'm by no means an expert either, but just in terms of the experience of the, the, the Aberdeenshire pilot, um, a comment made by many of our stakeholders fairly consistently is, is the option for more sort of local targeting of the funds. And, you know, we, we welcome the, the, the local targeting measures that have been put in place within SRDP, both, both within the agricultural options and also within the forestry options. Cairn Groms National Park are some very good examples of, of local targeting for forestry options there. Um, but we think that's something that needs to be taken forward and, and evolve further to allow this more, more local targeted measures, taking account of local wants and needs and circumstances and work that's done within comparable processes like the pilots and, uh, and that funding can be directed in that way in a more local basis. Uh, Grant Moyer. Um, uh, yeah, I, I should put, suppose I should put my hand up and say that I was the CAP policy officer back in 2005. So the, um, uh, the, the, this is something that I've been involved with. Yeah, I've been involved for a long time. Um, the, the, <laughs> yeah. oh, well, there's a question. Um, I, I think the the stuff on Pillar One um, is a bit of wait and see actually in terms of how how it pans out in terms of what people actually do, um, ecological focus areas, all these things, I think it's a bit of, we're going to have to wait and see. In terms of uh, Pillar 2, I think it's a big step forward where, where, this, where we are with this programme than where we were previously because there is more targeting within it, because it is more prioritised, um, because we are using data, and I think that's, that is a big step forward. Is there more to do on that? Yes, absolutely. We need to make sure that we continue to uh, get the best data involved, so we are specifically targeting because it's a limited pot whichever way you look at it and it will always be a limited pot so we've got to use that wisely and make sure that we don't have anything coming through the system that we're not too sure why that's coming through the system we want to make sure that it's the right things in the right place and it's at a scale and i think the big thing for me is the collaborative pot 
um, the, I think it's £10 million that's allocated to helping collaborative applications. I actually think that is the most crucial thing of the entire um, SRDP. If we can use that money wisely to get people coming forward in their, if you like, 10 estates working together or 10 farmers working together to bring forward big scale applications that will actually make a difference to those biodiversity targets, we'll deliver the 2020 target. If we rely on individual farmers to come forward with individual applications, I actually think we won't get anywhere in that 2020 target. So I think that collaborative pot is going to be used really cleverly and um, we're going to have to make sure that it's targeted at the right places. So um, I feel like that's the one that I'm keeping my eye on is how we use that. Quick follow on from that. So I know that there's proposed work in the next recess program on SRDP targeting. So we talked a lot about this new data layers that we're getting new information systems where we can put these layers together and I think part of the aim is to use these new sets of data that we can bring together to start doing that sort of focus SRDP targeting. So it brings us back to this point that we had in the beginning about targeting in the work and getting the best action at a local level, I think. Sarah Boyer. Just a quick follow on about where biodiversity fits in terms of um, spending money on farming. Who would, be, who would be leading on that to actually identify what value for money we get out of that? If we're saying that how we spend the money is really important. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll try and take that point on board, yeah? Unless anyone has a comment to make on it. So, so I'm just asking, because we just passed a statutory instrument earlier today after a bit of discussion about what kind of grass was in one bit oh, of yeah. the requirement and one bit was in another. And I'm just thinking there's a, there is a chance to pull together some of the biodiversity um, information we've had today to maybe feed that back to the ministers. There's the formal reporting mechanisms through SRD, P and CAP where, if you like, there has to be evaluations as to what the money has been spent on and what the impacts that have been. So I th that tends to happen and I think there's also, I think recess helps out with that. So I think there is, there's quite a lot of information that should come through the SRDP side of things as to what the money has been spent on and what its impact has been. But it, I'm not even sure if the one for the previous programme has been finished, because it tends to be after the programme that you get that information. So um, I'm not an expert on that bit, but there, are, there is definitely a monitoring programme that goes along with the SRDP that you've got to put back to the Commission and things like that. The features in that so yes. that it can be tracked yeah. through. Well, we should indeed, I think. Thanks for that uh, point. Jim Hume. Sure, if I think maybe it's slightly earlier because the the cap isn't really uh, yeah. happening yet. Um, we've, we've heard it's wait and see. IAX maps are going out now, and I think that they'll be uh, finished and back uh, with the government by the middle of May. Therefore, that's uh, perhaps, or they should be anyway. Uh, so that's uh, probably when we'll start to see the data coming in to see if there has been any changes, positive or not. Okay, that's what, certainly an important source. But well, mm -hmm. um, thank you, uh, yeah. Alec Ferguson. You want to take this forward um, a bit? Yeah. Yes, and it really follows on this uh, yeah. th this conversation, while also linking back to the opening sort of discussion we had. The area I want to look at, which is the, I think, conflict or or potential for conflict between the land management sector, if you like, and the conservation sector. On the other hand exists because I, I noted with interest that um, James was talking about a, a real willingness to, to cooperate and buy in um, to, to, to the various priorities that were being discussed and, and I, I'm glad to hear that is the case but I, I, I had a very interesting email from somebody who's very involved in this world who'd better remain nameless uh, in advance of this meeting and he told me that he'd attended the State of Nature conference recently and then the next day attended the Farming Scotland uh, seminar or conference, and he said it was really like existing in two parallel universes. He said that the, the language was completely different, um, uh, and I'll quote from the email. He said the conservationists were talking about the ecosystem approach and ecosystem services. Farmers were talking about markets and forward selling to try and avoid risks. And, you know, we've talked about incentivization to try to, to ensure that the, the land managers are playing their part in this, and I've, I've got some uh, sympathy with the need for it, because I, I do think that and perhaps I'm speaking as a former farmer here, but most, um, if, if you introduce conservation measures on your farm, you are tending to take away from the productivity level of that farm. Um, it's a bit of a generalization, but I think it's probably true on the whole. So you're therefore reducing your income and you probably want some incentivization to be able to do that. But I, I, So I think my, my real question is, do current policy objectives relating to land management 
have an adverse effect on, on biodiversity, does anybody think? And if so, what can we do about it? Right, I'm just going to take that. Uh, Derek? Yeah, I'd say Alex, some, some do, I, I, would, I would say. Um, but it, but it, does, it does come down to, to individuals. I mean, not, not, every, not every landowner, every farmer is the same. Um, people farm and own and manage land for different reasons. We notice that <coughs> the harder pressed tenant farmers will, will, in agri-environment schemes, by and large, go for management options where they get a regular income. And landowners tend to go for more capital options to invest in their farm and, and going forward. So there's a sort of split. You can see these splits and options that they go for going forward. And, and people might say manage land for all different, different reasons. So I think we have the mechanisms there. We have the mechanisms there. But we need to think more cleverly about how to go forward with these mechanisms and how we get people to, to, to implement biodiversity on, on farms and within catchments and how we get people working together. Because no farm is an island. Farmers want to do this work, but, but the incentives have to be there and have to work across farm boundaries and across catchment boundaries. And, and, and it's, it's that bigger picture that, that we're struggling with. How, how do we do it if the willingness is there? Inherent reason why, if you like, conservation side of things and land management side of things can't come together. I mean, there's, there's no inherent reason why, why that should be uh, the case. I mean, I do think that if you just looked at strategies and tried to find where they don't entirely fit together, you, you could probably do that as well. I suppose the bit that I would look at is that when you when you get down beneath some of the debates that you can have at a national level and you actually look at the practicalities that are a regional or a local or a catchment level or whatever it might be, an awful lot of those things tend to disappear to an extent and you can have fairly good conversations across the piece between you know, NGOs, land managers, tenants. You can usually find a way forward actually on most of these issues. So um, I suppose I'm relatively positive that actually if you get out and talk to folk and you actually sit around the table and you batter out what are the really important things from a business point of view, what are the important things from a conservation point of view, how those things can fit together, uh, you'll usually find a way, actually. Um, I do think we do, and it's not to say we shouldn't have national debates about things, and, but we do sometimes get into that theoretical thing of having an argument is something that the, the argument only works if you look at it at that level. If you actually get down and talk to people, you, you, you can usually resolve it. So um, I think that overall we should not try and drive a wedge between conservation and land management. I'd agree on language, there is definitely an issue. Um, I mean, if, uh, me personally, things like ecosystem services and natural capital, I, would, I, I wouldn't necessarily mention out loud. Um, I, I think the language you know, will put people off pretty quickly. I mean, I like the concepts, um, but in terms of you know, what are we actually talking about with people, um, I think we need to get back to talking about it in simpler language. So um, whilst... I think we, we need to do all that, and I think the farming community as well, in terms of their language, sometimes need to c come a bit t towards the other side as well. So um, I think there's sometimes a bit more simplification, talking with people, working at practical levels, working on practical things, can resolve a lot of this stuff. And um, uh, yeah, that's where I'd come to. Sorry, just to follow that up. I've no intention of trying to drive a wedge between no, no, the, <laughs> these two things. But I, I'm just interested when you mentioned the, nat the natural capital agenda there, because I was, I was quite taken with the... Um, submission we received from Scottish Land and Estates, because they actually mentioned, that, I'll quote from it if I may, it said, the natural capital agenda offers a potential mechanism to bridge a gulf between land managers and conservationists, because it could provide a way of aligning the desired outcomes of both. And I just wondered what anybody thought of that particular statement. Yes, I agree with the fact Fine. that the natural capital agenda could do that. I mean, I think it's... <coughs> Is it, worth, is, it worth, is it worth pursuing? Yeah, absolutely. It's not an either or. It's not a question of either you have food production and a, and a reasonable income mm -hmm. or you have biodiversity on mm -hmm. farms. Mm -hmm. There are ways of integrating biodiversity into crop systems that have production benefits for agricultural yield, intercropping or, or genetic mixtures, for example, for barley. Um, in an increasingly unstable climate as well, I think there's opportunities to look at these alternative cropping mechanisms because they might not bring year on year the same yield that, but they will give you sort of stability through time so we need a wider <coughs> perspective in terms of what we're getting out of the land and how it can support um, farmers there um, the issue is that reduced production equates to reduced income 
So are there ways that the natural capital that farmers provide can be recognised in terms of rewarding them in their income? Absolutely. That's what payment for Absolutely. ecosystem services mechanisms do. So Sue mentioned um, downstream benefits for fresh water and flood management. The payment needs to move back up to those people that provide it, and it's putting in place a mechanism that does that. I've talked to some of the people that work on this, the environmental economists. They say the key thing is to get that away from government subsidies. So it's not dependent on there being a subsidy mechanism, it has to work in its own right. So the people that get the benefit pay for the benefit to those that provide it. So it, there's, I think there's some great opportunities here to start having these discussions. I'm sorry, because this is really interesting, I think, because we, we've been talking a lot in a different field about creating a Scottish brand, um, particularly when it comes to food and drink in this year of food and drink. I, is there a potential to link a Scottish brand with the environmental credentials of the product that's, that, that we're talking about, uh, and, and which, which could produce a market premium to reward the producer in the way, exactly the way that you're talking about. I mean, is, is that the desired outcome? Is that doable? I think there are two ways in which it's doable. First of all, you get a premium. You can charge a premium for something that's got an environmental sort of association, so people will pay more from that. <laughs> the other thing is, there's interesting discussions with Norwich, Norwich Scotland during Scottish Environment Link, is that one of their aims is to shorten the chain from food producer to food seller. So they were looking to sort of um, not only grow the food, but also convert it into a marketable product themselves, so that they benefit, they maximise the benefit from that premium that comes back. From, so both of those things, looking at the supply chain and the production chain, as well as the, the underlying level of production, could have benefits in terms of promoting biodiversity in a wider environment. So James, uh, next. Just building on what I said earlier, which, which you obviously picked up on about a willingness. Is, I mean, it's, it's not going to come from news probably anyone around this table, but and I don't want to downplay at all the sort of economic market side of farming and, and, and also the importance of regulations and incentives, but something that came back strongly to us within the pilot was kind of the strong moral dimension um, land managers have. You know, words like kind of stewardship and succession were extremely important to them. And I think that's obviously a very kind of key route in in terms of kind of the environmental agenda. They do see themselves as stewards of the land. They obviously see themselves as, as wanting to produce food. But, but, but it's broader than that. And Derek mentioned the different types of land managers that are out there. So we really saw that as a route in to engage them on these issues around words like natural capital a little bit, but certainly benefits, benefits from nature. So there, there was a definite route in there. Grant Moyer. I mean, I think you know, things like... Um the potential for markets around carbon is obviously something that a lot of work has been done on. It, it's, I think what we've got to do is to now to work on how do you actually get that to scale so that actually people do start to get, you know, if you are looking after your deep beats, if you are looking after your, you know, your carbon you've got on your land, how does that actually translate into payments that are not to do the subsidy regime? And I, and I agree that's, that's pretty crucial. And I think there's probably, that's the next step we've got to take. And, and I mean, the statement about natural capital being something that can bridge, I, absolutely, I agree. I just, um, I wouldn't go um, and sit down with uh, my local farmers group and say, let's have a discussion about natural capital. <laughs> I try and couch it in some other language. And I think that's the bit where we've got to try and, uh, got to try and work on slightly. I'd echo those points. I'd, I'd agree it, it's worth exploring, and I, and I would suggest the Scottish Forum for Natural Capital is probably the best group to engage with to look at how that might roll out. That That is really our mechanism at the minute of really engaging with business, I suppose. We're starting to talk the, the language of business, including the farming, and I would say forestry communities as well. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, Jim Hume, perhaps this follows nicely on now. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, the guests here today were uh, concerned about any skills gap that, that we may have in biodiversity, uh, where those skills gaps are, and perhaps what we could do about that if there are uh, thought about skill gaps. It's almost inevitable, but um, when it comes back to the monitoring, taxonomists, you know. And there's a good plant life uh, report on this recently. There's, in some cases, there are fewer individuals that are experts on a species than there are individuals of the species left. You know, for stoneworts is one. There's only one person in this country that does stoneworts. But they're, you know, a key species in especially the, the outer isles. So taxonomic expertise in some of the unloved species groups like lower plants and lichens and mosses and stoneworts we're losing that, and it's a steady drip, drip, drip. And I think one of the reasons for it is it's not an obvious 
income generator. It doesn't make a lot of money, but it's just fundamentally important in knowing what we've got and what's happening to it. Did yeah. Who else was uh, so Sue? Yeah. Uh, just to what Rob said I was involved in a, a past work in a um, consultation with industry, asking them what skills biologists would need for the future, and we were given a very clear steer that we needed an increase in taxonomic strength in Scotland. And I don't think there's been any improvement at all and no uptake. And it is a real risk because our taxonomists are getting old and frail. And it's not so much just the fact that there's fewer of them, is that some of them actually are really quite old and can't do the job as well anymore. Um, the ageing... No, absolutely not. But the ageing you know, scientific but population. It is, it, is a, yeah. it is, you know, laughing apart. It's a, it's a, real, a real problem. Um, Simon Jones and then... Great. With our taxonomy, uh, his skills are really lacking, but there are young people out there who want to do these things, but it's having the mechanism to allow them to do that. So at the Wildlife Trust, we had to develop an ecological survey skills team, which was full of young, talented people with real incredible expertise in lichens, bryophytes, all sorts, but then they had to go and get jobs, many of which whom struggled, and the funding for the, for the scheme, of which I'm not... I might be wrong, but I'm not aware of any other schemes that exist like that anywhere in Scotland now to bring young sort of talent through. It was completely funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. The funding stopped. The course stopped. That, that's it. So by, you know, unless you have an opportunity and a real passion that you're lucky enough to live next door to the, the old guy who's an expert on lichens or wood ants, for example, it's, there, there is next to no way that you can just find find a way of getting through it and, and making a, a living out of it unless it's on on the back back of something else so it's that apprenticeship scheme i would suggest it doesn't have to be big scale but i think there's a there's a desire out there and scotland is well known for producing people like this who've gone to go on to do other things but there's we've kind of hit of a gap in the market now because there isn't anybody doing it at the minute training these people up just a point in the longer term it goes back to something that simon said earlier on about if we don't have the teachers taking the kids out into the countryside and lighting that fire, we're going to have a long... In the long term, we're going to have a huge problem. And part of the issue that exists currently is that the cost of hiring coaches to make these school trips out to these more remote areas is, as I understand it, the real prohibition of, of that sort of thing happening. So, yes, we've got a short, medium-term problem. We could have an even bigger problem long-term. Uh, so, well, three people want to come in, right? This is the lot. Right, so Rob, and then Grant, and then uh, to Sarah. OK, just really quickly, I mean, I think it just comes back to this issue of getting biodiversity into urban areas, into small gardens, into the schools. So it's great that you get the kids out into places like the Cairngorms, that's fantastic, but bring the biodiversity to them. You have the space, you have hospital grounds, you have urban green space, make it biodiverse as well as green. Yeah. But um, the, the, I mean, just on the, the travel side of things, there's a travel grant scheme in the Cairngorms exactly for that, which is that the, the travel issue is, is still is still a big one. So we, we still uh, subsidise that. The, the other bit I would say is not just on the, the core skills in terms of uh, what was talked about. The, the other side is, I think, the role that uh, FWAG used to play. Um, those skills in terms of the actual practicalities of turning. Um, some of the conservation things into the practical things you can do in the land management side. Um, it does reside, there are people, who, still lots of people do that, but I think there's probably, that's an area where again, um, the skills and the, the numbers of people um, are probably not what they were 10 years ago. So I think that is probably an area that we, we probably need to look at as well. If I, uh, so Sarah Boyack. Yeah, just picking up on two points really. Um, one, in terms of schools, I think it might be something for us to reflect on when we draw our thoughts together, um, whether eco-schools is the model, whether you want to bolt things onto eco-schools or whether there's something else that's needed. And the second point about um, having, having jobs for people who have taxonomy skills to go to, um, it's not clearly just enough to encourage young people to get interested. There have to be long-term careers. And is that something for SNH, James Hutton Institute? And I think you suggested from James Hutton Institute we need a totally new research organisation to deal with ecosystems. So is it building what we've got? Um, where are those jobs going to be and who's going to be responsible for making sure that we have a natural resource of people with those skills? Right, well... 
we're trying to wind this up just at the moment, so very briefly, Simon Jones. Just the eco uh, schools, and it was interesting what uh, Mike also said earlier, and, and I think there, there are some good examples, but 90% of eco schools are primary. At high school level, it just it drops away. So we are. That's that's where there's a big gap. That's where it starts to stop. So skills has got to be a continuous one, uh, from cradle to grave and all that. Uh, I certainly hope there's more than one person looking after the rusty bog moss at the moment, uh, amongst other uh, particular items of which we are species champions. But uh, we've had a very good round of uh, discussion just now, I think, from you all, because there's a huge amount of food for thought in this, and we will most certainly uh, you know, be exploring ways to turn these into practical uh, means for us to actually begin to take steps forward. People have said there's been enough theory. We've got the theory. We need the language right, but we also need the actions. And the actions in a time of uh, limited money are going to involve a lot of uh, fleet of foot, I think, in some, in some cases. So I'd like to thank all of you for giving us the chance to get this overall view, and uh, we'll most certainly be trying to make sure that the 2020 vision looks like that practical arguments that you've made just now. So thank you, witnesses. Uh, at the next uh, meeting of the committee, the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform will give evidence on the Scottish Government's biodiversity strategy, and will also take evidence on the review of agricultural holdings legislation from a panel of stakeholders. stakeholders. So I now close the meeting. Thank you.